at the, the first edition of this Modern Machine Learning Technologies Conference was held in Shatsk, Ukraine in um, June 2 to 4 in 2019. And this was still uh, on site. So we enjoyed a nice uh, setting for the conference at Lake Svitias and uh, could all meet in person. And we hope very much that these times will come back again. But this year still online um, edition of the uh, workshop. Um, so we had yearly editions of the workshop in 2020, 2021, 2022, where it was jointly with my university, Leiden University in uh, the Netherlands. And also because of COVID and other restrictions, um, because of the war situation, uh, we had to also do it online last year. Um, all proceedings uh, of this conference, we are probably to have published in the uh, workshop series at the European workshop series uh, that has um, publication on DBLP database for, so it's a registered uh, publication if you have uh, accepted full paper here and the papers are reviewed by an international jury and um, it is a peer review on the full paper. We will have about 50 papers presented in today's sessions and um, well, let me say it's uh, great that we have uh, received again a nice uh, number of submissions and um, there were also partners who um, sponsored the conference and helped uh, to make it uh, happen, which is uh, Lviv National Polytechnical University, Leiden University, the Montfort University in UK, University Institute in Lisbon, and for the proceedings, the Leibniz Center for Informatics, who has a DBLP server, where we have the conference proceedings published. Um, the, um, so I want to not uh, say much more word because we have uh, now interesting uh, presentations on various topics of machine learning, artificial intelligence, data science, hot topics, for the world of tomorrow. And we will see the latest uh, advances by various uh, scientists. And I hope you enjoy this edition of Momlet and it will be again a very interesting event for everybody. Um, it will be in an online format. So let's stay connected. Okay, I give the word to Mitro. Professor Thank Mitro. you. Thank you, Dr. Emmerich. <clears throat> Let me continue our uh, opening. And uh, if you please, I will show a few uh, videos also from my side uh, about Lviv Polytechnical and Leiden University. Uh, sorry if any inconvenience will appear, please. Take a look a few minutes. Ukraine is a state in the center of Europe a country with a rich history, ancient traditions, modern and innovative approaches to education and science. Many Ukrainian cities have powerful high schools that train specialists in various fields of economic and social life. One of the best centers of scientific life in the country is Lviv. Lviv is the cultural capital of Ukraine. Every year millions of tourists come to Lviv, ancient city walks, ancient architecture, original excursions, hospitality and friendliness, towns, people, and also modern infrastructure, convenient transportation, a developed business services network, and a powerful center for the IT community. All this attracts not only tourists to Lviv, but also young people who want to get education in Lviv higher schools. The National University of Polytechnic is the leader of dreams for thousands of entrants every year. 
a higher educational institution with more than 200 years of history, which today is undisputed leader of scientific and educational technical thought in Ukraine, Europe and the world. The university is known for its European academic and scientific traditions, training of specialists for educational programs of bachelor's and master's degrees is carried out by 16 educational scientific institutes, in which European students and students from other countries of the world master 66 specialties of bachelor's level and 135 specialties, among which 130 are master's level. The educational process is provided by 2,200 faculty members, among them almost 400 doctors of sciences, professors and more than 1,200 candidates of sciences and associate professors. In the Lviv Polytechnic, knowledge transfer schemes are being implemented. This approach enables the full implementation of new curricula for training specialists in conjunction with the leading technical universities of Europe and the issuance of two documents of higher education, Ukrainian and European. During its 200-year history, Lviv Polytechnic has trained more than 250,000 specialists who have become reliable support for the economy and other areas of life of the state. It's one. And one moment. One other. Also two. <clears throat> moment discover the world at Leiden University founded in February 1575 Leiden University is the oldest in the Netherlands and was the first to practice freedom of belief and religion the university has campuses in both Leiden and The Hague and consists of seven main faculties Archaeology, Humanities, Law, Medicine or the LUMC, Science, Social and Behavioral Sciences, Faculty of Governance and Global Affairs. For highly talented students, Leiden University offers a number of extracurricular programs. For bachelor students, we have Leiden University College The Hague. The university faculties and other buildings are scattered throughout both Leiden and The Hague and include a number of beautiful historic buildings as well as modern custom design facilities. The students who live and study at Leiden University give these cities a relaxed yet vibrant atmosphere. Leiden University has about 27,000 students with about 17,000 bachelor students and about 10,000 masters or professional students. These students include over 110 different nationalities, making Leiden University a true melting pot of culture, language and beliefs. Leiden University has about 50 bachelor programs, of which 10% are taught in English and about 80 master programs, with 250 specializations which almost 100% are taught in English. Leiden University is one of the top Dutch universities in the international ranking tables, such as the Times Higher Education and the ARWU. Leiden University has over 100,000 alumni, which include such illustrious names as our Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, and other Dutch and foreign politicians and leaders, King Willem Alexander of the Netherlands, and his mother, Princess Beatrix. Many of these famous names can be seen in what is known as the Sweat Room. This is a unique room inside the Academy building where students wait to hear their final results and then afterwards write their signatures on the wall. Leiden University has won the highest number of Spinoza Prizes between 1995 and 2016, which is the highest scientific prize in the Netherlands. To further strengthen this position, the top-level research is grouped into 11 interdisciplinary profile areas. Mm -hmm. 
Leiden University has a number of key partnerships. These include the Leiden Bioscience Park, which is the Netherlands' largest knowledge cluster in the field of life sciences and consists of over 90 specialist businesses. Leiden University is also a partner in Medical Delta, the South Holland Consortium of Knowledge Institutions, Business and Government in the field of the life sciences and medical technology. Leiden University has also joined forces with Delft University of Technology and Erasmus University to create multidisciplinary research centres and to offer a number of joint teaching programmes. To find out more about Leiden University, visit www.leiden.edu. Thank you for participation, Leiden University, with our workshop and the close cooperation between the Polytechnic University and the Leiden University. In face of Michael Emmerich and his colleagues. <clears throat> and today, I'm glad to see all participants and uh, um, all of you welcome to present your reports in two sections. Today we have uh, two sections in parallel and already second section started a few minutes ago. And uh, now uh, our timetable is 15 minutes for each report. 10 minutes for report and five minutes to answering questions, maybe there will be some questions. And uh, please be in time, uh, but when somebody will be absent, we will shift the reports upper, please. Don't leave our workshop until your report will be on that time. Thank you very much for participating, participating again in this joint session. And uh, we have five minutes break. And uh, after these five minutes, if you have no any uh, remarks, we will start our first section moment and data science work, machine learning session. Okay, please, Tatiana. Thanks, um, uh, Professor. Thank you so much. I'm here, well, um, I'm, I'm the secretary of the second section. That yes. is why I'm asking my colleagues, those who are supposed to present their papers at second section, well, unfortunately leave this section and go back uh, to our, our one. Can I please uh, send into this chat uh, the link to our second section for any case? Can I? Please. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do know that all have the conference uh, program, but still, well, another, uh, maybe that would be easier and faster. Thank you so much for the presentation. I love the video so much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm leaving for the second section. Thanks a lot. Hope to see you soon back again. And please okay. divide to two sections. Yes. Yes. Okay, I'm leaving like this. And already, maybe we will start. And who will be the first? Peter Biduk, Irina Kalinina, Alexander Zhepko, Alexander Goji, Tetiana Anichenko, who will take a word 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, all participants. Uh, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, our uh, paper. The topic of our paper is classification system based on ensemble methods uh, for solving machine learning tasks. Um, um, can you see my presentation? Yes, we see. Thank yes, uh, thank you. So, and introduction. Uh, rapid development of machine learning technologies now has initiated development of new methods and algorithms that more effectively solve data mining and forecasting tasks. The main feature of modern machine learning methods is not a direct solution to a problem, but learning from a set of examples, which allows these methods to be adapted to solve specific problem of processing large amounts of data and discover new knowledge in them. The use of uh, assemble methods in solving classification problem is an effective way to improve classification accuracy. Uh, to build an ensemble, several methods are used, each of which provides different accuracy. The assemble approach combines the results of indi individual classification uh, methods and provides better accuracy as compared to using uh, a single classifier. Uh, to build uh, an uh, assemble, several uh, techniques are used to aggregate the results of the underlying models, uh, each of which provides different accuracy. Bagging, boosting, and staking are the most common approaches to building assembles. And uh, the problem statement of our research, uh, the purpose of this paper is to study assemble methods for solving classification problems and, uh, a and uh, to develop a classification system based on a two-level assembles assemble of models. Classification system based on assemble methods. The main idea of uh, assemble classifier is that they work better than their components when the base classifier are not identical. A prerequisite uh, for the useful of the assemble approach is that the base classifier must have a significant level of disagreement, which makes errors independent of each other. The limitation of uh, homogeneous assemble frameworks can be overcome uh, by using heterogeneous assemble frameworks, and creating an assemble is usually a two-step procedure. A set of uh, different uh, base uh, models are generated by running different uh, learning algorithms on the training data and then the generated model are combined into assemble and uh, the structure of two level assemble for solving the classification task to solve the forecasting task a two level assemble learning structure was purposed uh, as shown in figure one the assemble structure consists of a base model training unit and a two level assemble training unit each of which interacts uh, with a model quality assessment unit the models with high bias are selected for the first level of assemble learning and the models with high variance are selected uh, for the second level of uh, assemble learning and uh, data set description and preprocessing um, uh, two data sets were used to create a classification system based on, assemble, on uh, model assembles, e-commerce shipping data, and air false safe noise data set. The first data set consists, uh, contains information about shipping data obtained uh, uh, from international uh, e-commerce company, and uh, the data uh, and the purpose of classification is to identify the factors associated with the risk of uh, late delivery of uh, pre-orders to customers and the information uh, uh, about uh, goods. Uh, and uh, uh, data preprocessing includes uh, checking for missing observation, non-numeric and uh, anomaly values, converting categorical data into numeric data, selecting features and normalizing data. The check reveals that there are no new, non numeric uh, or missing values in any attribute in the data set uh, selected for the research. Uh, the integral methods uh, was used to check the data for anomaly values. And it was found there is no outliers in the data set. And uh, factor variables are converted into uh, are converted to numeric variables. And the second data airfall. Um, Self noise data set was designed to study the aerodynamic properties of materials. 
and uh, the profile span and uh, observer position were uh, the same in the experiments. And the resultant value is uh, scaled uh, sound pressure in, in level in decibels. And uh, to solve uh, the binary classification task and any additional um, and any additional variable was created instead of uh, dependent uh, value. Uh, it takes the value of one if uh, the dependent variable is greater than uh, uh, their own median and the end value zero if it's less uh, than its own median. And the data preprocessing steps for the second data set are the same as for the first data set. And uh, so quality metrics for classifier and assessing of uh, classifier plays an important role uh, in building and selecting a classification model. And many quality metrics are used in machine learning tasks. Uh, the most common performance uh, metrics take uh, into account in the model's ability to distinguish one class uh, from the others. And in this case, uh, the class uh, of interest is called positive, while other are called negative. And so the relationship between negative and positive classes uh, can be represented in form of uh, uh, discrepancy matrix, uh, which uh, shown in uh, our slide. And we have here uh, four values, true positive value, it is um, correctly classified as uh, class of interest, true negative, uh, correctly classified as not belonging of uh, class uh, of interest, false positive, uh, uh, incorrectly classified as uh, a class of interest, and uh, false negative, uh, incorrectly classified as not belonging to the class of interests. Uh, and uh, such mismatch matrix uh, is basis for the most uh, important uh, model performances matrix. And uh, uh, this is the accuracy is the ratio of the sum of true positive and true negative values uh, to the total number on focused task. And uh, we have our uh, two other metrics, uh, for example, error rate, uh, kappa statistic, uh, sensitivity, specificity, precision, recall, uh, or completeness F measure and uh, receiver operating characteristic curve and uh, area under this uh, curve. Uh, so, and uh, the results uh, of classifier work, uh, classifiers work. The main advantage of the two-level assembly is systematic use uh, of assemble methods and the selection of uh, base uh, classification models for each level of assemble learning. In the block of training uh, base models, the following models are, were selected as basic classification models. Uh, and uh, we have chosen uh, the following uh, uh, models, uh, basic models, decision trees, uh, naive Bayesian classifier, linear discriminant analysis, uh, quadratic discriminant analysis, uh, logistic regression, uh, support uh, vector machine, uh, nearest neighbor methods, artificial uh, neural networks, uh, and uh, random uh, forest model. And uh, most of the models have satisfactory performance, but the results needs to be improved as the company seeks to improve its sales and delivery services. Therefore, a two-level assemble model is built to improve the result. Uh, and uh, is input data, the test scores of the basic models are selected and added to the test set. In two-level assembles, learning block, stacking, and begging are used sequentially. At the first level, the stacking method uh, is based on a logistic regression model. Uh, model stacking is an effective assemble method, and forecasts generated uh, by the base model and uh, are used uh, as input uh, for training uh, data at the first level. Thus, the basic, uh, the basic models of the first level are decision tree, uh, naive Bayesian classifier, linear discriminant analysis, logistic regression, nearest uh, neighbor methods, uh, and artificial neural networks. And uh, the second level is Bagin, uh, using uh, Baggett uh, card algorithm. And one of the disadvantages of the Baggett trees it, uh, is that uh, a small number of additional training observation, and uh, it uh, can dramatically change the prediction performance uh, of the training tree. And uh, the base model of the second uh, lawyer is uh, the first level model stacking uh, uh, on logistic regression random forest uh, model, uh, quadratic discriminant analysis, and uh, support vector machines. And uh, 
um, uh, table one shows uh, us the various uh, performance of uh, indicators uh, for the uh, first uh, data set. This data take into account the model's ability to distinguish one class from another, prediction accuracy, capacity, statistic, and sensitivity, specificity, precision, uh, F measure, and area under the receiver operating characteristic curve. Uh, the, da <clears throat> the data, excuse me, in table one shows that decision tree and uh, uh, quadratic discriminant analysis methods have the best specificity and accuracy scores, while decision trees are the highest precision. F measure has the highest value for the random forest and uh, linear discriminant analysis result, uh, and the area under the Rock curve is the largest for classification results using decision trees. In general, the best line, uh, baseline classifier performed in average on this data set and uh, needs to be improved. And the artificial neural network uh, generated the worst result. Uh, by uh, uh, by making use of staking to combine six results of base, uh, uh, baseline classifiers, the overall results is improved. Begging to combine three results of the basic classifier and the results of the first level staking significantly improved, and the overall results for all evaluation metrics. Thus, at the first stage, combining some basic models, the accuracy was uh, increased to 70%, and, this, at, and at the second stage, uh, combining some basic models, uh, and, uh, taking models uh, using uh, begging to increase uh, to the model accuracy to 88%. Uh, table two uh, shows the value of classification error rates uh, for the models in data set number two, which are necessary for the correct selection of base models and the first and second levels of uh, assemble learning. Uh, and uh, table three shows the values of performance indicators uh, for the second data set. And the, for the first, uh, for the second data set, at the first stage combining the basic model increased to 77%. And at the second stage combining some basic models uh, and staking model into assemble model using begging increased the model accuracy to 82%. Thus, uh, the use of two-level assembles increases the efficiency of uh, classification models. And uh, conclusion, the general structure of uh, two-level assemble was developed based on two-level assemble learning uh, structure in the processing of two data set, uh, the uh, classification quality was improved. The procedures for processing uh, the data set, including identifying and uh, describing key quality characteristic of the model, searching metric, uh, selecting uh, models, uh, selecting parameters uh, for the base model and assemble methods. And preliminary data processing was also performed and the basic uh, data sets were divided into training and test uh, uh, samples and input variables were generated uh, based of um, <clears throat> Uh, excuse me, uh, based on the analysis uh, of metrics for the assessing quality of basic classifier, it was determined that they need to be improved. And uh, uh, a two level assemble scheme uh, is used for uh, improvement. And at the first level of assemble, staking uh, was used to reduce the bias uh, of the base model. And this approach resulted in preliminary improvement of classification quality. Uh, and at the second level, begging was used to reduce the variance of the base model. Thus, the uh, use of uh, assemble-based classifier solves the problem of finding a compromise between uh, bias and variance, which improves the classification result using machine learning models. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, you use so much, uh, so many basic models. It's huge work, I see. Uh, it's hard to understand which model you don't use in your uh, Yes, I, I used uh, nine uh, basic models. Uh, and uh, this model gives us uh, different results. Uh, and uh, I try to combine, uh, for example, in the different uh, levels of assembles, uh, different models with different results. Uh, for example, 
uh, artificial neural networks gives us the lowest results. Uh, and uh, for improving um, uh, the results in the two level, I use quadratic discriminant analysis because it gives uh, uh, maybe the uh, one of the highest results uh, on our data sets. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Maybe somebody have a question to the reporter from participants. No, any questions? Interesting results. Uh, and once more question, um, data set number one, data set number two, uh, what is the um, muchness? Uh, power, uh, power of your data sets, yeah. yeah. Uh, you use uh, uh, so, um, uh, the first data set uh, has uh, um, 11,000 of observation and uh, uh, one uh, and uh, maybe maybe 12 uh, attributes uh, and one uh, uh, independent value uh, reach on time or not uh, and it is uh, our resultant uh, value uh, and uh, the second data set uh, has uh, 5000 observation and uh, um, seven uh, attributes mm -hmm. Thank you. It's uh, interesting about scale. Okay. If uh, nobody has questions, thank you to you, Dr. Zhipko. And we thank are going to much. next report. We have time for second report. Dmitry Klushen, Andriy Urazovsky, locating change points in multidimensional time series using non-parametric methods. Please. Okay. Awesome. Good day, dear members of the conference. My name is Andrei Rozovsky. My scientific director is Professor, Doctor of Physical and Mathematical Sciences, Klusen Metro Anatolius. Your attention is offered research on the, on the topic locating change points in multidimensional time series using non-parametric methods. This work is devoted to locating change points in multidimensional time series using non-parametric methods. The task of testing the shift hypothesis and the scale hypothesis are considered. Formulation of the problem. Let there be two independent samples obtained by simple random selection from general populations having distributions F1 and F2. And there is a search sample containing first the elements of one general population and then the other. The task is to identify the number of the element after which there was a change in the general population from which the elements were taken. I'd like to note that since we work in a multi-dimensional space, each element of our time series is not just a number, but a multi-dimensional vector. For this, we will use the petunia statistics and Fisher's linear discriminant. Let's move on to the consideration of the statistic. Petunia statistic. Two samples, X and Y, and the ordinal statistics were taken from two general populations, G1 and G2, with the corresponding distribution functions F1 and F2. Let A, I, G be the event that Y, K falls into the interval X, Y, X, J. We can calculate the expected probability of this event. Let H, I, G be the observed relative frequency of A, I, G, and delta 1, delta 2, with the confidence intervals for P at the significant level beta. Let the capital N is the number of all confidence intervals at delta 1, delta 2. L is the number of those intervals, I, I, J, that contains the probability P. The statistic H will be called the P statistics. And uh, if H is not more than 0.95, then H0 is rejected. Otherwise, it's taken at the level of beta. The purpose of our experiments is to demonstrate the accuracy of the following algorithm for a stationary time series, which should find all change points and test the homogeneity hypothesis. At the beginning, we take a quiz and design the elements, the starter months, with which we will continue to work using the sliding window methods. 
When we have a sample, we do the following with it. Build, building a linear Fisher discriminant for samples and find the projections on the line. Rotate the resulting straight line so that only one coordinate remains and make the rest the same. Getting projections. Calculate the Petunia statistics p state for the resulting sets of projections. If p state is at least 0 0.95, then we say that the new sample has the same distribution as the original one. Otherwise, we say that the other and shift the starting sample to position i plus one and the second one to position i plus two. We shift in, uh, our sample one position to the right, to the right and start the algorithm from the beginning. We do this until all the data is gone. If sample after element x n become inhomogeneous, then the point x n plus one regarded as a change point. Numerical experiments. To demonstrate how the algorithm works, we take a series of lengths 400 and divide it into four equal intervals with different distributions, which will be shown in blue, orange, and green. Then we run our algorithm 100 times and average the values of errors after which we display the found change points and as blue crosses. For each experiment, we calculated the five measures of error. Mean absolute error, MAE, mean squared error, MSE, mean squared deviation, MSD, root mean squared error, RMSE, and normalized root mean squared error, NRMSE. To demonstrate the effectiveness of the described algorithm, we will rely on the latter value. As is well known, if uh, n, r, s, and e is greater than 0 0.5, the results can be considered as random. If uh, n, r, m, s, e is close to zero, then the results are considered as good. Nearly non-overlapping uniform distributions with different means. Let's consider a solitary time series, which is composed of uniform distributions that practically do not overlap. On this time series, we will able to test the shift hypothesis. In this graph, we can see the values of all three values depending on the number. As can be seen from this figure, the desired change points are 100, 200, and 300. And on this slide, we can see the values of all three values from the previous slide with the found change points. As you can see, the found change points, as blue crosses, are quite close to, to the real ones. The second, uh, let's consider a self time series, which is composed of uniform distributions that with uh, distinct means that display significant overlap at the outset, followed by mute overlap, and ultimately no overlap. On this time series, we will able also to test the shift hypothesis. In this graph, we can see the values of all three values, depending on the number, and as can be seen from this figure, the desired change points are 100, 200, and 300. On this slide, we can see the values of all three variables from the previous slide, along with the found change points. As you can see, the found change points as blue crosses are quite close to the real ones. And the last, uh, let's consider a self time series, which is composed of normal distributions with uh, identical means, but those variances begin to differ gradually. On this time series, we will check the scale hypothesis. In this graph, we can see the values of all three values depending on the number. As can be seen from this figure, the desired change points are 100, 200, and 300. And on this slide, we can see the values of all three variables from the previous slide along with the found change points. As you can see, the found change points are quite close to the real ones. And conclusion. In conclusion, our study has pre presented a novel algorithm for detecting change points in time series data that combines Fisher's linear discriminant and Petunia statistics. Our numerical experiments have shown that this algorithm can accurately and quickly detect changes in a wide range of distribution functions. Additionally, our algorithm has several advantages over existing change point detection methods. Firstly, our algorithm does not require any assumptions about the distribution of the data making it more flexible and apl applicable to a wider range of scenarios. Secondly, the computational complexity of our algorithm is relatively low, which makes it efficient and scalable to larger datasets. Finally, our algorithm provides interpretable 
Results which uh, can help researchers and practitioners to better understand the nature of changes in the time series data. The implications of our results are significant as our algorithm could have practical application in monitoring the health status of COVID-19 patients in clinics. By accurately detecting changes in the vital signs or symptoms, medical professionals could intervene earlier and improve patient outcomes. Furthermore, we have evaluated the performance of our algorithm using NRMSE, which measures the accuracy of the detected change points. Our NRMSE values demonstrate that our algorithm works accurately. However, we acknowledge that there are limitations to our study, such as using simulated data in our experiments. Therefore, the performance of our algorithm may differ when applied to real-world data. Nevertheless, our algorithm provides a valuable contribution to the field of change point detection, and we plan to evaluate it, its performance on real-world data in future research. We hope that our combination of feature line discriminant and petunia statistics will inspire future research in this area and contribute to improving the accuracy and efficiency of change point detection algorithms. Overall, our study provides a promising foundation for future research in this field. That's all, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, anybody have questions to reporter? Andrei Urazovsky. No? Um, I saw... Um, um, how it will be in Russian, <laughs> in English, firm that uh, your decision making, that uh, it is change point, not parametric dependent, mm, this, you know, your last uh, demonstration, the last picture, show that uh, such decision which point is change point is so subjective, do you know? Can you show previous slide uh, with picture? In here, yes. It may be we have three time series and uh, only one time series shows maybe changes, but uh, no, all, the, is all the data is uh, three-dimensional vector composed by uh, three variables. All, all three, yeah. But decision made by only by T T one. Uh, uh, all, for all three, like points in uh, three-dimensional space, and uh, we can. Uh, find the change points in three-dimensional space, not one-dimensional. But in your model, maybe some parameter you can change and uh, the change point will shift in to the left or to the right. Uh, all three variables are changing. They all three have uh, different distributions uh, for this time series. Okay. No, it can be shown better for this, or maybe this model. We can see the jump. Yeah, yeah. Here, here we can. Or maybe yes. here. What is your question, sorry? It's look. It's look like a oscilloscope data. Yeah. Oh, it's self-tutorial time series. Yes. Yeah. Looks like oscilloscope. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, it's my only subjective point of view. Maybe um, your method is quite effective. It's look like using Kalman filtering also can give such change points like your method, but it looks very simple. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.
if nobody else have questions, we are going to third report. Irina Kalinina, Peter Beduk, Alexander Goji, and Pavlo Malchenko will be reporter. Alexander Goji. Yeah. <clears throat> Please. You see? Yes, yeah. we can see, of course. Yeah. Good afternoon, dear colleague. <clears throat> my name is Alexander Goji. Uh, the topic of my presentation uh, combined forecasting basis on time series models in machine learning task. Uh, recently, machine learning uh, technologies uh, have taken a uh, taking position in the market of intelligent solution. On the main task uh, solved by machine learning technologies is forecast improving the quality of predictive solution is uh, archived by various method and approach. One approach is to use a combination uh, of forecast, a combination of forecast have become a wider spread in recent year and have become part of the main direction of research to improve the quality of forecast uh, solution. Uh, combining and emergent multiple forecast from a single data that is now widely used to improve it, accuracy by um, integrated information from different sources. This uh, reduces the risk identifier of the best prediction. Uh, combining evaluations, combining uh, method to <clears throat> uh, combining scheme have evolved from the historically closed, simple evaluation less uh, combining method to complex method uh, involving time variant wise nonlinear combination the relation between components and cross training. They include uh, a combination of point forecast and combination of probabilistic forecast. The study of uh, effectiveness of various uh, combined forecast is relevant. Uh, next slide uh, presents the statement of problem. Uh, <clears throat> research on method of combined forecast. Uh, next, the development of uh, methodology of building combined, uh, combined forecast based on methods combine, combining forecast estimates. Uh, development of the architecture of the forecast information system based on time series models and research of the effectiveness as, uh, and other. And next slide uh, presents the uh, <clears throat> method of combine, uh, combining forecast estimates for solving machine learning tasks are built on the basis of simple average on uh, widened combination of forecast and regression. Uh, this method present in table. And next slide uh, presents the <clears throat> uh, uh, combined forecast based on time series. The methodology consists of the following stages analysis and preliminary processing of data set, a division of prepared data into training and test samples, modeling and forecasting based on basic model, uh, formation of the wide coefficient uh, to combined forecast based on evaluation of the effectiveness of basic model. Uh, until for uh, combining and evaluating forecast. The next slide presents the uh, architecture uh, <clears throat> information system based on time series model. Uh, next slide uh, presents the uh, numerical uh, experiment. As an example of the application of the techniques of combined time series, forecast the text. Uh, of forecasting the share price of three companies, Amazon, Facebook, and Google uh, are considered. The shares data set uh, loading into the information storage system is contained information about the value of companies at the time of closing and trades on the period from January uh, 2016 to May 2019. The data were collected from website finance.com. 
and <clears throat> slide present the stock price data uh, for three companies after recent values are restored. And next slide uh, present the stage, the <clears throat> uh, uh, methodology stage. This is uh, first stage uh, is data set uh, predictive block. Uh, before starting the process building pre predictive model for it for the time series, the initial set were divided into two parts training and test samples. The last 10 observations were led uh, as test samples corresponding to a forest horizon of 10 days for short term forecast. Next stage, uh, stage uh, modeling. Uh, in uh, ARIMA statistical, uh, statistical models, models built on the basic of the method of the fitting uh, <clears throat> regression model GAM and forward uh, propagation of typical neural networks uh, are used uh, as basic predictive models in the model block. Uh, in table uh, present the ARIMA models, uh, ARIMA 1 models is automatically uh, generated uh, on the basis of full search. ARIMA 2 uh, model is uh, automatically generated of basic of quick search and ARIMA 3 model is automatically generated with motion. The ARIMA 4 model is best model for manual selection of uh, <clears throat> parameters. And next slide presents the GAM model. Uh, monthly additive GAM1, annual multiplicative GAM2, annual multiplicative and weekly additive GAM3. In table presents the GAM model. In uh, <clears throat> slide presents the uh, artificial neural networks. Uh, artificial neural networks can be considered as non-linear regression method. The main advantage of uh, neural network is the ability to model complex time series without pre-work knowledge of the data creation process. In addition, neural networks are important for uh, the communication function between input uh, and input and no. Uh, as a result of the experiment and the possible to find better architecture of neural network. 3, 10, 1. <clears throat> 3, 10, 1. Excuse me. <clears throat> Next slide, uh, the present the uh, increase to accuracy of the combined forecast forecasting is performance of models with close variance values. The GAM model uh, has a variance value uh, that is significantly different from the variance of the other models. Therefore, for GAM models was most considered in the next iteration of a combined forecast, the tables show a comparison of forecast estimators from the Amazon time series for ARIMA uh, neural network and the combined models. Two table uh, present the result come uh, combined models. And next slide present the uh, <clears throat> result uh, forecasting, uh, combined forecasting uh, in uh, <clears throat> uh, present the uh, in, uh, figure. From the analysis on table, it uh, follows the combined uh, predictive model has the quality indicators compared to the basic models. Of graphical representation, uh, the prediction result using the combinant model in show figure. Uh, the 18% and 95% prediction interval is uh, very, very uh, low. Con conclusion. The solution uh, to the problem of forecast the price share of commercial companies using a combination of both basic forecast model has been started. Method of combined forecast based on simple mean, white iteration and regression uh, and <clears throat> uh, are investigated. A methodology for building combined forecast based of method of combined forecast estimated has been development the architecture of the forecasting information system based of time series model has been developed. It's been 
confinement is a forecasting process of the arbitration nature is necessary to use a both separated method and a combination of forecast estimated calculated using different methods. Uh, thank you for your attention. Ask your question, please. Thank you very much, the reporter. <clears throat> you should be rich because it's a field where when you can successfully forecast such uh, stock market, you should use yeah. your capital to increase it. The, you combine different forecasting methods in one, your personal, uh, yeah, uh, as I understand. Yeah. <clears throat> and, yeah. And, but maybe it should be uh, some waiting one forecast method should be divided uh, on two and another forecasted method uh, multiplied by two and use it in some uh, linear combination of different forecastings. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, no, uh, improving the quality of predictive solutions uh, uh, is uh, achieved by various methods and approach. In this uh, method, uh, we use uh, the simple version uh, of forecast, weighted combination, and uh, regression. Uh, main mm -hmm. result uh, this uh, report, uh, this uh, information system and information architecture uh, for uh, combined forecast. Uh, forecast uh, result uh, using combined forecast uh, have been improved. Improved. Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, <clears throat> in this field, uh, strongly nonlinear uh, time series, nonlinear. And uh, maybe such methods, uh, such regressions, and so on, mm -hmm. uh, cannot give good results because uh, not all factors are taken into account when you are forecasting. Nobody can forecast uh, some hidden hidden uh, factors. Yes. Which, uh, yeah influence on behavior of as such forecasting parameters. We understand this problem. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank I you. wish you best results and uh, you will make thank fortune you. when <clears throat> it will be. Thank you. Best result uh, is uh, uh, combine forecast. It's yeah. uh, my main result, I think. Okay. We'll... Maybe somebody else have a question to report him. No. Then, thank you, Dr. Goji. Yes, thank you. Thank you for participation. Yeah, we are going to next report. Arais Ahmad Dar. Yeah, yes, sir. Good morning. Yeah, sorry, I don't know how to call you, doctor. Yes, you can just call me Rais. Rais, yeah, okay. Yeah. Please, you have. Shall I share my screen? Yeah, yeah, please share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just a moment. Yes, we can see. So good day, everybody. And uh, thank you very much for giving me this uh, opportunity to present my research at such a prestigious event. 
the topic of my research uh, today will be a survey of COVID-19 related fake news detection using machine learning okay. models. Okay. So I'm Raees Ahmed and uh, I'm from India, Jumu and Kashmir to be specific. And I'm co-authored by Dr. Rana Hashmi, who is a scientist C at the Department of Computer Sciences, University of Kashmir, Srinagar. So the first of all, what are the objectives of this research? Basically, one of the primary uh, objectives of this research is to uh, combine two of the biggest available at the time of writing this article. Uh, we uh, basically collect and then clean and then combine two of the biggest available data sets on the COVID-19 related fake news. And uh, later on, we make them uniform so that uh, they come on the same scale. And uh, the next important uh, this uh, objective for this research will be to implement various classical machine learning, deep learning, and pre-trained language models like the Distelbert or the Arubert A, and then uh, train them and then evaluate on this combined corpus that we have obtained by combining the uh, two data sets. And we later on compare the performance. This is just a survey or a review. So first of all, the introduction, what basically is a fake news. So any kind of news item. So we are specifically focusing here on social media, basically, not on any print media or something like that. We are focusing on the fake news spread on uh, this uh, social media sites. Uh, sorry, maybe, maybe you can uh, change your screen because we see only title, titles uh, slide. Okay. Is it visible now, sir? Yes, but um, we see only your title slide, first slide, but we cannot see the uh, rest of your slides. Maybe you change slides, but we can not see yeah. them. Yes, I'm changing the slides, of course. Uh, one moment. Uh -huh, okay. I will just restart the share, just stop and then again share it. Is it visible, sir? But uh, is addition, maybe functional K5, F5, please press yes. to, to share. Yeah, yeah, and it's, okay, very good. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for Okay. So uh, the fake news will be defined as any sort of new, any uh, news article or post posted on whether Twitter, Facebook, or any kind of social media site that can be verified as false. Uh, that's the introduction of the definition. And uh, it, at the times of it gets uh, worse at the time of some event or some incident is happening, like the uh, flood situation is happening or COVID-19 like pandemic is happening, it gets to its worst because people uh, tend to believe in these kind of news very fast and without verifying the facts. So uh, the verification step is quite important and the detection and uh, removal of these fake news from the social media sites at the earliest is quite important in this kind of world. So uh, manual fact checking has been there since long, uh, but it's very cumbersome and uh, it's uh, practically impossible. So we'll, we'll be fo focusing on the automatic means, specifically using machine learning, data mining, and uh, the other language model. So a lot of research has been done in this. We'll be, uh, for, we'll be analyzing uh, these, uh, some of the baseline methods and comparing their results on these two uh, these uh, data sets on COVID-19. So, so the description of the data sets go goes like this. The first one is the COVID-19 FNIR data set, available online, and uh, it is a bal it's a balanced data set, meaning uh, it contains uh, equal number of uh, fake and the true news. And another one is COVID-19 fake news data set, also available online publicly, and uh, it is also somewhat uh, balanced, meaning equal number of fake and real news. So finally, we are combining them. For example, uh, we are making the column names uniform and uh, we are removing the extra columns and uh, so that they come on the same scale. And uh, so the, what are the studies, uh, studied models on these this combined corpus? Uh, from the traditional machine learning models, we are uh, Analyzing logistic regression, random forest, K nearest neighbors, SVMs, MNB, multinomial neighbors, uh, XGBoost, and decision trees. 
and uh, from the deep learning ones we'll be focusing on uh, cnns and lstms and a combination of them at the at the end and uh, from the pre-trained uh, language models we'll be analyzing a mini version of BERT that's the distal BERT, ROBERT A and a combination of ROBERT and by LSTM. So what features we'll be studying in this analysis uh, for the, in case of uh, this traditional machine learning models we'll be focusing on TFIDF feature and uh, we are getting the embeddings from the fast text and uh, BERT word embeddings we are also using here. Uh, for the traditional machine learning models, we will be comparing their results later on. We are so essentially we are comparing uh, their results on three uh, different features. And in case of uh, this uh, deep learning models, we are using GLOW and BERT as the word embeddings for CNNs and LSTMs. And uh, in case of pre-trained language models, as is uh, already known, uh, they uh, depend on their own corresponding embeddings. So they have their own tokenizers and uh, we need to get the embeddings from their uh, specific tokenizers. So the traditional machine learning, we are, we are just using the vanilla, these models. We are not changing any parameters as such. And in case of uh, this uh, deep learning models and uh, CNN specifically, we are using a one dimensional convolutional layer, uh, two layers of uh, convolutional uh, uh, basically, these are one dimensional and we are using 128 filters and each with a, a filter size of five. And as I already told that uh, BERT and GLOW embeddings are used here. And uh, the output of this convolutional layer is later on passed through a ReLU activated uh, activation function before being uh, fed to a max pooling layer, which is uh, used for the dimensionality or the feature reduction. Okay, and after that, a dropout uh, is applied. And uh, finally, uh, of course, a dense layer, because this is a binary classification problem. We want to predict the uh, news as fake or real. So we are using a sigmoid activation, activated uh, this uh, dense layer. And uh, the learning rate is set uh, to 0 0.0001 for this model. And in case of LSTM, uh, we are using we're using the 300 dimension size embedding size uh, from the pre-trained glow embedding and uh, we're adding a dropout uh, more than this year we applied to SCNM before feeding this uh, into a sigmoid activated function uh, uh, we are actually applying the dropout layer so we also did one more thing we up uh, in a, instead of the glow embedding we obtained the BERT embedding of length 1 to 8 and uh, then on uh, analyzed their performance and compared the BERT embedding uh, this performance with the uh, glow embedding performance. We are uh, training it for 10 epochs and uh, we are setting the bias size to 64 here. And then a combination of them, basically uh, this, uh, this achieved the highest performance uh, among the deep learning models. Uh, we are this, uh, <clears throat> this CNN model as uh, this is just a, this is a essentially a hybrid model of the CNN and a LSTM, a LSTM layer, uh, where basically defining the CNN model as uh, was de described before, and then before passing it to the final dense layer, we are passing it uh, through a LSTM layer. And then from the pre-trained language models, we are using the lighter version of BERT because of the resource, because of the resource utilization of the original BERT model. We, we, it, it is not feasible for us. And uh, that's why we use the distal BERT model to analyze the performance. It obtains the performance uh, somewhat close to the original BERT model by being the resource in X, uh, this not, not utilizing so much resources. And uh, another model we are analyzing over here is the RO BERT A. This is a robustly optimized BERT. Uh, this, uh, this is uh, made lighter by removing one of the primary, this objective functions of the original BERT model. That's the next sentence prediction. And uh, we are applying a dropout of 0 0.4 on this, uh, on the final output. Uh, of course, there's a classification head because this is a, uh, this binary classification problem. And uh, at last, we are analyzing a robot A and a biolestium layer on top of it to extract the bicontextual, these features. So these are the results we obtained. I'm sorry about the alignment. I don't know what's happening in this. Uh, out of the machine, these uh, classical machine learning models, the SVM is uh, performing best, uh, achieving an accuracy of 
82.39 on the fast text word embedding and on the word embedding it achieves an accuracy of 81.73 percent uh, so the fast text is actually performing better uh, compared to the word embedding and uh, the f1 score is uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It, it, it is performing best on TF-IDF feature, actually, uh, when TF-IDF features are used and uh, are trained, this SCM is trained on them, it's achieving an accuracy of 84.29, the fourth column. Uh, and it achieves an uh, F score of 84.75. So SCM is performing best among these classical machine learning models. And uh, out of the deep learning models, we are, uh, as, as I already discussed, we are using two um, different embeddings, low and the word embedding. And uh, the CNNs are achieving an accuracy of 84.53 on the glow embedding and are achieving better and slightly better on the word, word embeddings. And uh, the LSTMs are performing better than them, uh, achieving an accuracy of 85.5 on the word embedding. And a combination of them achieves the best among these. This is a hybrid model. This achieves the best, achieving an accuracy of 87.3% uh, and an F1 score of 86.50%. So the CNN plus LSTM performs the best among the analyzed models. So out of the language models, the distal bird uh, achieves an accuracy of, uh, as I already discussed, they would use their own corresponding embeddings. Uh, distal bird achieves an accuracy of 88.90, uh, this 51, sorry, uh, percent accuracy. And uh, our, our Robert A, this achieves an accuracy of 89, better than the distal bird. And uh, when we apply a BIOLSTM head on top of Robert A, it achieves the best among all. Uh, this accuracy of 92.34 on the test data set and an F1 score of 92.36. So these are the results. So in conclusion, our uh, this analysis can provide a good starting point if uh, new research is to be done in this field. And uh, this can be a great starting point for new researchers, as well as we are focusing in the future on multiple modalities of these uh, news items. Suppose uh, if we talk about the Twitter data, We'll be focusing on the URLs, the visual features, the meta features of the user of uh, like the tweet itself, how many times it has been retweeted, uh, who, is, who is actually retweeting the news, what is his sentiment. We have actually built a model and that's performing, uh, that's providing us with promising results, but we have not yet published that. And uh, so there's a lot of scope in this work and there's a lot to be done uh, in this field. So these are some of the references and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And if there are any queries, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, interesting and actual task. Thank you. Fake, fake news detection, but uh, it's, uh, I'm curious, is possible to, um, to find out which news is fake which is not only by such kind filtering <coughs> yes sir. Uh, even don't know maybe somebody want to have want to give a question to the reporter For example, when somebody, not uh, computer, not uh, intellectual system, but real man, try to okay. distinguish which news is, which message is fake, which is not, how is yes, we should de detect? So if we, if we talk about, uh, yeah, non-technically, he has to manually do it. He has to manually verify uh, the fact from an authenticated person. Suppose if it is uh, news, if we talk about the COVID-19 itself, if there's a news about some medication, like if we take, uh, there was a, actually a news, uh, uh, so if we take Dolo, that's a paracetamol tablet, it uh, five tablets a day, there was actually a tweet, uh, it will treat the COVID, but it was a fake news. So if we uh, talk uh, about it non-technically, uh, if, we, if, we, if there is some novice, uh, novel user, and uh, he, he's not uh, technical enough, to analyze and do this stuff, he has to verify it from an authenticated or authorized person only. There is there is no other way to verify. 
Hmm. Okay. Yes. So that's uh, yes. that. That is infeasible in these kind of uh, in in the tech in this technical era because the news gets uh, spread so fast like the wildfire. Uh, it 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 is uh, impossible to stop it from spreading if the, if there are not any automatic uh, these uh, detection methods uh, that are. Uh, incorporated in the social media platforms that will uh, detect the new, uh, fake news at the earliest and uh, avoid any uh, these uh, circumstances or situations from happening. Mm -hmm. Yes, problem is actual, really. Uh, after COVID-19, another problem can appear and uh, this problem yeah, it can be applied to any similar problem, any similar pandemic uh, happening. Yes, like, yes. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Any thank other you. questions to reporter? Proposals or comments? No. Thank you. Thank you for thank you very support. much. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Yeah. Thanks. Next reporter. Roman Odarchenko, Azamat, Iman Baev, Hala Pinchuk. Who will? Roman Odarchenko. Okay. Thank you. Please. Hello, dear colleagues. Can you see my screen? Yes. My presentation. You can, you can see. Yes. I, I hope. Oh, sorry. So you can see the first slide. So today I will present the our paper, which is titled Development of the Testbed for Testing Deep Learning Based Idea System for 5G Network. And uh, here uh, we are representatives of National Aviation University, me and Ala Pinchuk. And Azamat Imanbaev is my PhD student from Kazakh National University, Almaty, from Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. So the problems description and problem statement. So it is. it become obvious that 4G, 5G networks will become a part of critical infrastructure also 4G and 5G will connect other sectors of critical information infrastructure. So, and we need new security requirements uh, that has to be identified. What, uh, what is the negative impact for now? Now we have the new landscape of cyber threats in 4G and 5G networks. Also 99% uh, of cyber attacks traverse the network in some way. And 5G networks are more vulnerable to cyber attacks and their, than their pre predecessors. Uh, now we have established the next expected outcomes of our ex successful solution of our paper. The first is satisfying of the network security KPIs, key performance, performance indicators, avoidance of cybersecurity incidents and potential losses, and new communication solutions for emergency situations for special users or special subscribers. Uh, stakeholders of our solution, which will uh, leverage something new and uh, helpful from our solution are the next. So the first is critical infrastructure facilities in the field of telecommunication and other sectors, representatives of relevant state bodies. And the last one is mobile subscribers, which include special groups of end users, uh, for example, from government. So we have identified the research summary. The main idea of the solution is to develop a new IE-based model for cybersecurity network function implementation to the 4G and 5G core network architecture. So the goal is provisioning of the highest cybersecurity level in these networks. And key elements, of course, are IE-based algorithms, uh, monitoring probes, MAC nodes, 4G, 5G core, and cloud. Uh, we used open source data sets, which is uh, listed here. And also we used the background from law of Ukraine on telecommunication decision of the government, orders of the president, plans of 5G development in Ukraine and law of Ukraine of, on critical information infrastructure. So we used for our research needs methodology, which is based on machine learning, deep uh, machine learning and deep learning. So you can see uh, this architecture on the slide. So we use the data set, data pre-processing, then we train the data set, use the multi, uh, machine learning and uh, deep learning algorithms, uh, and then we tested our solution. So for our uh, network, for our solution, we propose the next architecture. 
uh, which is represented here. So you see the 5G network, 5G, which is uh, connected with the 4G core uh, and also 5G core uh, as a separate one. So you see here we have different uh, groups of subscribers, which is connected to the network uh, using the base stations of 5G or 4G. Uh, also, we assume that we can insert our machine learning, uh, deep learning algorithms in the edge uh, on the base stations, also in the cloud, like a CSF server. CSF, it is a cybersecurity function. So everything will be done in 5G using the network function virtualization technology. So we assume that we can insert our uh, solution, our mechanism to this CSF server. And then uh, we can detect cyber attacks using and uh, analyzing the traffic uh, using the features of the traffic. So type, typical use cases are the next. So we can detect malware, hijacking, meet and probe, R2L attacks, U2R attacks, DOS, DDoS, and also botnets. Uh, implementation of the proposed solution is the next. So we assume that we can insert this CSF function, like a separate function to the core network, which will detect uh, and which will uh, react as a um sort uh, or c sort which will detect and also shares information about the cyber incidents and uh, you see the algorithm which was developed by us by our team and we see the place of artificial intelligence for the next step so we can detect firstly attacks and also then we can predict the cyber attacks. Also, we can place our solution to the edge server like a CSF app application, which will be placed on the edge and it will help to detect uh, attacks very earlier on the earliest stages. So we uh, have developed this network in the intrusion detection system, and we use the next data sets. We analyzed a lot of data sets, which are open source. And then we come up to using NSL KDD data set, which is uh, for us, it was uh, more helpful. So we trained our solution, but it was done not on the real network because we did not have an access to this network and we received some uh, results. So accuracy of our solution was quite good. Uh, so here you can see the whole statistics regarding the testing of our solution for different types of attacks. And average accuracy, we received 90%. Um, but we uh, did not stop, so it was done one year or one and a half year ago. And now we have developed a new 5G network. We have established this network in the National Aviation University. We have um, decided that we need to, to test our solution on real networks. That's why we decided that we need to deploy and to develop our own network in which we can test different use cases. We can analyze different types of attacks and so forth. And of course, it is very expensive if you will use the commercial solutions. That's why we decided to analyze open source solutions. And you see here the summary of these open source solutions, which we um, tested, which we analyzed. And after we analyzed them, we have come to solutions that we will uh, use the next architecture of network. So we use ATOS USRP B. Uh, 210. Also, we will deploy Mac. We use open air interface. Also, we are using controller as Azer. And we use SD core solution, open source solution for core network of our 5G. Uh, we used some uh, information from our colleagues from Global Logic. That's why I highlighted them here. And they help us a lot. So here you can see the detailed. Uh, description of our testbed solution so with IP addresses and so forth. Um, 
but I I would like to highlight and to be honest, we uh, did not start the testing of our 5G solution because we don't have uh, this USRP still, but we have Lime SDR and with Lime SDR we can build and set up only 4G network and we have tested, we have our network which is working, you can see this is a screenshot of our um, monitoring system and you see that uh, one subscriber was connected, it was really done, so here you can see testing of this network uh, with megabits per seconds which was transferred via this network, so uh, it was successfully tested. And for the next year, for this, I, I suggest half of a year, we, we expect to receive this USRP and to test real 5G using open source solutions. And then we will be able to test our artificial intelligence based solutions uh, regarding the um, cyber attacks detections, prevention and respond. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, please ask. You're muted. Uh... Um, me muted. No, 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 Metro is muted. I can see. Yes. Sorry, sorry. Yes, I am uh, unmuted. I have a question. Maybe somebody else have a question, but then I will have. The to the Romano Darchenko. Nobody. What's the difference uh, for you between four G or five G? uh networks you tested your system only on four four generation network as i understand but what so, is the difference uh, as the difference for us is we will use mac uh, solution so it is mobile multi-access edge computing yeah. so okay. it will help to detect uh, on previous on earlier stages the cyber attacks um, and everything will be done using the, um, so to be honest, yes, for us, it is, uh, we don't have a lot of differences between 4G and 5G setups. That's why we deployed 4G, but we expect to deploy 5, uh, 5G mm -hmm. in the next half of a year, and uh, then we will test it. Okay, then uh, you test it on uh, too many different uh, kind of attacks you said uh, show it uh, uh, slide with mm -hmm. different uh, kind of attacks uh, and you use artificial intelligence to detection these attacks uh, but what methods you, you use for mm -hmm. detection mm -hmm. you have some zero oh. and no, okay. You have time series and detection uh, and detect attacks. What methods are you used? We used random tree forest for mm -hmm. detecting attacks, but uh, uh, okay. it is still under the develop under the research of our of our teams. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, you apply your detection system in different place you said you showed on on server and uh, on some um, network uh, system inside uh, in cloud or in uh, some devices on the on site on traffic uh, yes we assume to use different different probes in different uh, parts of network because we can detect attacks 
firstly from radio interface. The second, we would like to detect them in transport network because of attacks, we cannot detect them immediately in the edge because um, if they will connect, so it will be an attack. If you connect, uh, only you connected to a network using radio interface, it will not be attacked. But if, if we have 1000 of bots, which is connected to different parts of networks, and then they, this uh, data stream is connected to one data stream, so it will be an endos attack, for example. So that's why we use different probes in different parts of networks, in transport network, in the radio in interface, and, and in, a, in the cloud, and uh, also in core network. And what software you you use for, for detection? Uh, not software, but language uh, you showed uh, some piece of code. What language um, is it for? It one? was Python. Python. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. And it, you can use Micro Python too for some smaller devices for transport level. But look, as I underlined, uh, so we have now solution which is tested but it was tested on the data sets which we are using from the open source solution mm -hmm. and for now we would like to uh, test this our developed uh, uh, software using this real network and we can analyze different types of attacks and the, their behavior on real network because you understand that data sets okay they we used and we learned and a lot of resources they worked before but how it will behave in the real conditions it is a question that's why we would like to test mm -hmm. uh, you mean some test bed what is a test bed maybe? yeah 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 mm -hmm. i mean yes test bed mm -hmm. okay sorry too many questions Thank you. Thank you for, 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 for the interest for to the research. <laughs> really interesting, yeah, of course. And thank you. We are ready to go to the next report if nobody else have a questions. Nobody. Thank you, Dr. Rodarshin. And uh, next is Serhi Robotko. Yeah, already ready. Uh, yes, hello everybody. Uh, just let me know that everything is shared. Um, so, yeah. can you see? Yeah. Okay, that's good. Uh, so, yeah, I'm presenting the National University of Shipbuilding based in Mikolaev and the uh, actual trademark company, the Mark V. Our topic is the machine learning and modeling of the impact of trademark feelings on GDP growth based on Python. Um, uh, as we cast our eyes on this colleague of the brands, uh, it's clear to see that wh uh, whether the big or small, renewed or budding, every brand plays integral part of our global economy. These logos aren't just about the consumer recognition. Each trademark symbol's names logos reflects a unique story, a mission that the value of com uh, companies bring to their customers. Uh, and this uh, in turn shapes economy landscapes. Uh, as we navigate through the increasingly globalized economy, these trademarks aren't merged decorative elements. They are strategic assets in the case the business confidence and both consumer trust and competition. So as we uh, will dive deeper in our decision today, let's remember the trademarks are not just the brands. They are economic catalysts and significant contributors to the country's GDP. Uh, our common goal uh, in this study is to investigate the complex relationship between trademark feelings and GDP growth uh, across approximately 160 nations. We seek to the understand how intellectual property rights, uh, especially trademarks, acts as key drivers of economic development. 
The research combined comprehensive data analysis with the development of the machine learning model to predict GDP growth based on the dynamics of trademark films. This study aims to provide critical insights that can be inform effective policies and strategies to stimulate economic growth and reinforce the service sector global. So diving into our data set, uh, uh, encompassing 160 nations, we observe striking uh, disparities in trademark fields. China leads significantly, having registered uh, at EMU's 67.5 million trademarks, predominantly with the last decade, reflecting its uh, switch industrial and economy uh, straightness in 2023, which may impact the pace of this future trademark registration. Other countries, including the United States, Japan, India, and Brazil, also demonstrates substantial trademark film uh, indicative of their innovation uh, propensity and economic dynamics. The nations with the scans trademark feelings often exhibit parallel economic uh, circumstances. Uh, hence, while integrating this data, uh, it's crucial to remember that the role of the trademark feelings is one significant economic indicator with the broader economic context. Uh, so in this scheme, we can see the development of the machine learning model to predict GDP growth based on the number of trademark applications. Uh, as depicted here, we have followed a systematic process that starts with the preparing and the end with the prediction uh, and organization of the future GDP growth values. Uh, the procedure initiates with reading CC data, um, specifically GDP service percentage, GDP growth data, and trademark filling count. Uh, next, we extract, organize, and prepare the necessary data for the years 2010, 2020. Uh, post this, we train our machine learning models, especially linear regression and random force on this data. Uh, uh, upon trading, we plot the results to visualize the understand of performance of these models, comparing the actual and predicted GDP growth values uh, we then employ this trained models to predict the future GDP growth for each country. And finally, we organized and saved these predictions in data frame for the future in-depth analysis. This uh, cyclical process is efficiently aided by Python libraries like Pandas, NumPy, Scikit-Learn, Matplotlib, which facilitates data processing, analysis, and visualizing. Uh, the combination of linear regression and the random forest uh, offers to comprehensive, reliable approach for predicting GDP growth based on trademark filling data. The prediction 2021. In this slide, we present the most accurately predicted countries by our model for the year 2021. This list includes 16 countries which comprise about 10% of our total data set. For this nation, the difference between the predicted GDP growth using linear regression and the actual GDP growth percentage is less than 1%. Uh, this accuracy showcases the potential of our models when the uh, underlying economic uh, variable align closely with our model assumption. Uh, nevertheless, it's important to know that this high level of accuracy is presently limited uh, to small subset of countries. Uh, in this slide, we examine the top 10 countries, which is highest GDP growth in 2021, and compare it to GDP growth predictions from our linear regression and random forest models. It's clear that uh, accurately predict uh, extreme GDP growth rates remains the challenge. For example, consider Maldives and Macau, China, both of these uh, experience high GDP growth rates, 
but hang significantly different predicted from the models. It could be due to the uh, unpredictable factors that are difficult to cross for such impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has dramatically disrupted the global economy, affecting supply chain, uh, worker dynamics, and consumer behavior, leading to substantial GDP frustration. Uh, this is the common uh, statistic. For 130 countries, it's 81% of uh, our total. The difference between the predicted GDP growth using linear regression and the actual real GDP growth is less than 10%. This indicates that linear regression model is able to provide a reasonably close estimate of the GDP growth for the majority of the countries. In 88 countries, it's 55 of our total. The difference between the predicted GDP uh, growth uh, using linear regression and the actual real GDP growth percentage is less than 5%. Uh, this feature highlights uh, the model ability to predict GDP growth reasonably well for more than half of the countries. For 16 countries, it's 10%. The difference between the predicted GDP growth using linear regression and the actual GDP uh, growth percentage is less than 1%. Um, so in conclusion, uh, we'll explore the intricate link between the trademark and the global economy. Studying trend across the approximately 100 at six, in the 60 uh, countries We've demonstrated that the advance of the machine learning model, especially linear uh, regression and random forest, can efficiently predict GDP growth based on trademark feelings. The linear regression model showed promising results with the predicting and actual growth different by the less than 10% for over 89% of the countries. However, the evaluating against 2021's actual data highlighted uh, the need to consider additional economic variables and the significant extreme ev events for when building predictive models. Our study offers val uh, valuable insights uh, for stakeholders in the global economy and indicates that we are refining our models and incorporate new data. Uh, we can gain a, a deeper understanding of the relationship between intellectual property, innovation, and economic growth. This knowledge is, uh, can inform decision-making and foster strategy, um, strategies for sustainable and uh, inclusive global growth. Thank you. And, uh, uh your questions please thank you very much any participant maybe have some question to reporter uh, do you think uh, that it's only indicate indication that gdp and uh, uh this um, trademark how it will be what they do with trademarks uh, in your case you estimate trademark uh, declaration and so on and that these trademarks and ggp only simple correlated each other some correlation exists between two these parameters yeah sure uh, there is exist the, uh, and, some uh, you you predict uh, growth of gdp using data about uh, growth of uh, trademark declaration but uh, you should know in advance how will be increases declaration of uh, trademarks in this country and uh, these statistics is very general a uh, very um, um, average for 80 percent of countries or 80 countries maybe i forgot that you said 
80 countries, dependencies no less than no more than 10 percent yeah as you said 10 percent um, mistake or error in prediction but um, when it, it cannot be applied to uh, special country is in average 10 person but to each country separate country it should be very different yeah i'm angry uh, i'm angry with you here uh that uh this, this connection between the impact the gdp on the trademark feeling and uh the trade the trademark feeling on the gdp but uh, the main goal is that we can uh just know about uh the future growth or the some decrease in the gdp earlier than for example the government can give us this result so because uh each month we can uh, analyze uh this is the growing of the feeling or the or, or if this number will down when can, we can say okay the next month or the next quarter uh the gdp uh can be down or grow so yeah i agree it's it, it can, could be useful yeah because you can this trademark um what you said feeling trademark says um could be um, evaluated and you can predict gdp growth it's interesting of course thank you thank you maybe Perfect. somebody else have a questions in details it seems to me that uh, as you said in the at the end of your report uh, many parameters can be taken into account and the uh, factor analysis should be applied to evaluate which another parameter could influ influence on all this all this gdp growth not only uh, trademark uh, labeling of forgot every time and forgot but another indicators could be used and uh, even simpler than this one you take me okay it's... yeah yeah thank you uh, and actually i'm planning to continue working with it and the, a lot of indication can be here even this some um, uh as we had had the previous um topic uh the news for example we can just add here the uh, uh the number of the bad news to add here about the some country or something like this and we can calculate this impact to the gdp2 and add it here the risk can be a super a uh, huge number of the factors that can be here and yeah actually i'm planning to add here uh, a lot of these indicators yeah yeah thank you yeah thank you okay okay um thank you for your report and we are going to the next report number seven wilson ayara tenitore abioe cannot see this participant Number seven, exploratory data analytics of multivariative observational metrics on generative generative artificial intelligence. No, not present. Cannot see. Okay, then we pass this uh, report and going to the next. Сергій Гнатюк, Метропус Проскурін, Тетяна Охрімінко. Добрий день. Так, Метропус Проскурін присутній. Окей, дякую. Лісо. Присутній. Тільки за вчинуну, я. Добре. Добре, я не маю. 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 Я не маю.
Okay, thanks. Yeah, I hope uh, you can hear. Uh, you can hear me without any problems, and you can also see my screen. So if if there are any problems with this connection, just let me know. But uh, apart from that, uh, let me present our research, which is related to predicting pseudo random and quantum random number sequences using hybrid deep learning models. So uh, first of all, uh, random number generation is a crucial component of many applications, including cryptography, secure communication systems, or simulations and pseudo random number ge generators and quantum random random number generators are two main types of uh, generators which provide uh, better security and to their, uh, which basically uh, can provide better security to due to their uh, unpredictab unpredictability however predicting uh, the next sequence in this uh, generators or the whole second itself remains an, an essential task to assess their security and reliability. And therefore, deep learning techniques such as CNN, LSTM, or NN have been extensively used in various time, uh, in, in, in various uh, time series and prediction tasks. And in this paper, we are going to propose a hybrid deep learning model that combines uh, CNN, LSTM, and RNN to predict uh, a next a sequence in the pseudo random number a generator and quantum random number a generator data sets. And we're going to also compare them to the existing models, which have been researched by other teams and other universities, and to prove that combining several, several techniques and uh, models together can, pro can basically provide a better result. So our goal was uh, our goal of this research was to investigate the effectiveness of various deep, uh, deep learning model ar ar architectures, and as I have mentioned, including C CNN, LSTM, and RNN, and to try to predict the next uh, uh, the next value in the sequence of a random a number a generation a data set and quantum random generation a data set. Another objective is uh, was to assess whether the trained model can achieve better prediction results than a random baseline because you have to remember that if uh, basically we are if we're able to randomly assess the next a sequence and it, it's uh, and uh, a deep learning model uh, has basically at the at the same baseline then uh, then we can assess and we can conclude that uh, the model is not predicting well and it, it was not trained to proper assess uh, at the sequence itself. Uh, the, but uh, to ensure the fair comparison, we're going, uh, we were using the uh, appropriate evaluation metrics, uh, such as mean squared error or uh, I mean absolute error, because uh, we, we have to remember that uh, the basic accuracy uh, evaluation methods, which are available in uh, all the libraries, which are used for uh, training uh, deep learning models, cannot be properly used when we're trying not to predict the exact value, but a possible next value, which means that we have to leave some, we have to leave some, uh, we have to leave some space for uh, for error and for basically a cloud of, of possibilities. That's why we are using an uh, we, we, we are using error techniques which which have a, a tolerance. And if the predicted sequence and or the value in the sequence is within that a tolerance, it means that deep learning model predicts well and uh, and and the and the a generator is not properly reliable and and not basically random. And finally, <clears throat> we were aiming to provide insights into the practical implications of using such deep learning models to predict random number sequences uh, or random number sequences from both uh, basic generators and the new quantum ones, as well as uh, to discuss the potential future uh, research directions and applications of such a technique. So <clears throat> if you take a look at our uh, methodology. Uh, okay, 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 please, please. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah you, uh, apologies, you had, you had a question or? No, 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 uh, I, I, it's, uh, it's very good, please. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so if we, uh, if we uh, take a look at our methodology, so the uh, data sets that we use in the study were consistent of both uh, pseudo-round number generators 
uh, degenerate sequences and quantum random number generators sequences such as Marsan Twister, linear regression generator, and uh, commercial university provided quantum number generator. So, and uh, these uh, data sets were divided into training, validations, and test ones, ensuring a balanced representation, and of course, uh, which were uh, different for each experiment to, 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 to be provided. And uh, if we take a look at the model architecture, so we tried a different ones, but we stopped on the hybrid deep learning model, which combines several layers of CNN, LSN, and RNN, and tries to predict uh, basically the next the next a sequence in the validation data set based on the on the training data. We were trying to we were trying to test uh, several approaches when it was trying to predict the next uh, a sequence only on the data it was it has been trained on and then on the validation data and uh, uh, we were trying to assess the results. So all the, uh, the results we have in this paper and basically in this research are based on the validation that I said that the model has not seen during training, which as, as we believe uh, is the baseline for any research and model evaluation. And also, uh, so basically, and the final output of the model was a single linear activation unit that produces, that produces the predicted value. And uh, the model is then trained using the uh, optimizer and uh, the mean squared error uh, used as a loss function, and then uh, and then as the uh, and therefore as the evaluation technique. And uh, yes, uh, so and in the end, uh, while the the next value in the sequence is predicted, uh, we quantify the similarities between the true values and the predicted ones uh, that was uh, calculated using this uh, coefficient. This metric measures the linear relationship between two data sets with a value close to one, indicating a strong positive relationship. So, and we have predefined a threshold of, uh, of 9.1. Therefore, if uh, if uh, the predicted value is within the stretch, uh, threshold, we can uh, we, we can say that uh, the model predicts the next, the next uh, sequence, even though it's not exact. If, if, it's, if it's very close across the whole validation data set, it means that the deep, deep learning model can predict the next value without any problems. And uh, so, uh, we proposed, uh, you have an example of this model on your screen right now. So as you can see, it, it, uh, it, it's, it's, not that, it's not as deep as you can imagine, uh, because we were using a data set of sequences, which were length, uh, uh, for, I believe, from five to 10 uh, I, I digits. And um, uh, we had uh, the whole data set consists of uh, 1,100 uh, sequences I generated. And um, I, I using this, uh, uh, hybrid model, which consists of uh, CNN, LSTM, and then RNN with some additional, of course, optimization techniques and data set preprocessing. We were trying to use all of this one on the data sets and then try to use the basic ones as uh, pr 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 proposed in, pre in previous research, as, such as uh, CNN, LSTM, RNN, and just to compare the results. Because our main goal was to prove that not only the combination of models is better, that also that it can be done. That uh, in some cases uh, the uh, deep learning architectures can be used to assess the random number uh, generators, and that uh, one model can be used for several uh, generators due to their architecture or model baseline. And uh, and uh, for, first of all, we of course uh, run the uh, run the uh, basic CNN and RNN modules on that uh, data set, and we can see that. It, uh, it was very hard to, the, to uh, not only to predict the next value in the sequence, but also to find any trend lines or to find any uh, dependencies on the data in order to learn. And because we were not able to use uh, proper accuracy techniques and uh, uh, proper loss functions, that's why we had to uh, we, we had to only we had to only look at the uh, value it was predicting and uh, at the and uh, and the uh, uh, mean squared error in order to assess how well the model is working. And uh, from the screenshot on the screen right now, you can see that both CNN and RNN had the basically a very hard time, not only in predicting the value. Uh, the, the blue line is the actual value, and the orange line is the value predicted. So we we, we can see no correlation 
and basically it would be better just to use uh, just to guess and the result would be even better but then to, 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 when we tried our habit model we basically combined these two models together we can see that it does it uh, way better not only uh, not only it uh, has uh, a high variety of uh, predicted values in some cases in some cases the values were either exact to the next ones so the, the, the predictions was uh, not exact or close to exact because uh, I remind that uh, the exact accuracy is very hard to achieve when we're trying to predict and not to label or classify the next value but also the uh, the model was was uh, working well on uh, assessing the trend of or the, uh, the trend of the next value or of the values itself which as for us was uh, a result a very successful result because it, it proves that deep learning model can, not only can find some uh, similarities in the pseudo-random number generators, but it can, also, it can also be used to assess these types of generators. And uh, that's why uh, we believe that, uh, well, that's, uh, that's why we believe that further research is required in this field. So, and uh, to conclude, uh, to conclude, I would love to say that, uh, so we, we uh, created, so to create a, a novel hybrid deep learning model that combines several types of neural networks techniques and combines several previous research together. And as a part of, as a part of future work, we are planning to explore either hybrid, murdered, hybrid model architectures that could further enhance the performance of our current model. And also we aim to investigate that uh, how using of additional features such as uh, information from uh, uh, another domains or uh, either optimization techniques or even uh, either that, uh, other types of data sets can further improve these uh, capabilities. And our end goal is, is to study the generalizability of our model, which can be used to assess uh, which can be used to assess any uh, pseudo random generator in the future and be uh, and be adjusted using a, a neural evolution in order, in order to combine several approaches together. So yeah, this is it from our side. If you have any questions, just let me know. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your report. <clears throat> any questions from from the participants? I have a few questions. Why sure. do you choose uh, such uh, pseudo-random generators? Two kinds of generators. Uh, so the idea to use this to to test your method of predict. Uh, so um, that that's a very good question. And uh, when we started and the beginning, when we started this research, this was this was the main question we asked. Like what kind of generators we should use in order to either prove our theory or just to forget about it. So basically we saw that about one of the previous researchers were using the basic RNN LSTM in order to predict next sequence in the linear congestion generator. So which means that with this a generator, which is not as random, which is pseudo random, it's very easy to predict the next, the next sequence. But at the same time, the RNN could not predict for example, the next the next sequence in the uh, Marcin Twister one, which means that the same model does well on one data set, but does very poorly on the on, on the next one. So we assume that if we try to if we try to combine several ones and try our model on 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 them, uh, uh, basically in sequence, just to take a look whether our model is is working well on set a different types of uh, generators. That's why we took one that definitely works. Uh, else. CG1, that one which doesn't work and it's proven, mustn't twister one. And then um, uh, a quantum run at quantum one because this was, uh, we had uh, uh, basically in the, in the university, we had a propriety uh, library which were uh, generating a quantum number, uh, random number of generators. And we were trying to check it as a part of different research just to continue working on this one. So basically, from our side, this is, was our understanding, and that's why we went with this kind of uh, generators. 
Okay, but uh, do you think that uh, uh, your method effectiveness depends on the uh, source of uh, random um, sequence? No. Definitely. Definitely, and, and, and that's true. And that's why our, our future research is not only to try on a different type of agenetics, but also we have one, just one model, which will work on all of them. And now you can see that it works on these three. And that's why uh, as a part of our future research is try to extend the number of generators it works on uh, at the same time, optimizing it and uh, keeping the results together, just to try to make sure that we have one theoretically one model which can be used to assess any type of generator in the future yeah but uh, and last one question mm -hmm. sure, sure. It's, uh, <clears throat> um, has a sense uh, to investigate the mate not nature no but uh, structure of uh, this uh, this time series for example autocorrelation function, how it mm -hmm. looks like, maybe it's, it's uh, a white uh, Billy Shum. Uh, uh, noise. White, white noise, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, correlation zero time. Uh, that's true. But, uh, with, but uh, we were thinking about that as a part of data pre-process, because we're thinking of the ways we can actually pre-process the data set trying to clean it in one way or another. But, with the, but then we understood that like from the research point of view, it would negate the result. So in our case, we need to work on the data set itself. And if data set provides a uh, white noise, like noise values, for example, for one reason or another, uh, this is how, how the a generator works. And basically our, our uh, model should be able to handle that in, while, in one way or another. And this was the problem because uh, in some cases, as you know, even if you're talking about student random number generators, you can receive uh, noise values as a part of number generators. And, and because of that, we were, we, were, we, were, we were trying to apply several optimization techniques, which would allow us to basically to teach our hybrid model to work on that. But, and we saw that just a combination on different, of different architectures, like CNN, LSN, and RNN is a specific sequence, allows to handle this kind of noise values uh, with, uh, with some success. But of course, future research is required because one a generator is producing more noise than another one. And this is just a problem we'll have to work on in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting report. Yeah, I, I thank you too as well. So uh, if you have any questions, just let me know. But yeah, I, I thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. If nobody else has questions, we are going to next report. Who will be next? Serhii Vladov, Yuri Shmelev, Ruslan Yakovlev, Yuri Skulchansky, Yuri Havrilyuk. Yeah. Hello, do you see my presentation? Vlado. Okay. Yes, we can see. We can see it. Thank you. Good afternoon. With your permission, I present a work. Neural network method for controlling the helicopter's turbo shaft engine's free turbine speed at flight modes. The helicopter's turbo shaft engines are a complex thermogas dynamic system with many features that must be taken into account when designing an automatic control system. The quality of control of turbo shaft engines parameters largely depends on the quality of tuning of electronic algorithm. Often an in electronic control system of turbo shaft engines linear controllers of P, PD, PY, and PID type are used. Their popularity is explained by the simile, simplicity of the mathematical description, low cost of implementation, and sufficient efficiency. However, as practice shows within the framework of the linear theory, it is not always possible to the 
tune the PID controller to ensure the required quality of transient process in nonlinear system, which are helicopters, turboshaft engines. Under this condition, the use of neural network technologies is relevant and promising. When controlling complex nonlinear objects such as a helicopter's turboshaft engines, such controllers can not always provide the required quality of control over turboshaft engines parameters, stability and robustness of the system under changing operation condition and failures. In this case, it makes sense to use alternative nonlinear controllers. For example, it can be a fuzzy logic controller, which has the property of robustness. However, when using this type of controllers, the hour short values range from 0.1 to 2.2%. In order to eliminate Overcasting increase statistical accuracy and develop a method for controlling the speed of the free turbine of helicopter turboshaft engines using neural network technologies. This is an urgent scientific and practical task. The main task of an automatic control system of helicopter turboshaft engines is to maintain the rotational speed on the main rotor. This task is accomplished by controlling the free turbine speed through the required fuel flow rate. In connection with the foregoing and improved typical circuit for maintaining the free turbine speed of helicopter's turboshaft engine with a linear PID controller is proposed there, presented in this figure. In this work, the neural network training method based on the method of programmatic gain adjustment developed by Professor Volodymyr Zubov, what future developed with, with by integrating direct data transmission into a dynamic neural network. When synthesizing the controller, a dynamic neural network of direct data transmission was used based on neurons with a radial basis activation function in the first layer and adalinous neurons with a linear activation function in second layer. At the same time of test examples, the optimal settings of the neural network were obtained, which provides the smallest overshoot for a given time of the transient process. The following sequences are used as neural regulator inputs. A reference signal, a master sequence that determines the final state of the object. Controller output, feedback from the controller output, Object error, the difference between the reference signal and the real output of the object. Integrable error, the error accumulated by the controller for the entire time of the object operation. Object output, signal from the object output. The automatic, automatic control system structure, which includes a neural network in the role of the setting the coefficients using a PID control, controller is schematically shown in the second figure, in which the neural network plays the role of the sum functional converter that generates the required coefficients of the PID controller for a set of input and output signals. In the experimental work, the input signal obtained according to previous equation is used and an analysis for the TV3117 turboshaft engine, which is part of power plant of the Mi8M TV helicopter, according to the data obtained on board the helicopter during the flight. This slide shows the results of input signal pre-processing there are diagram of dependence of the signal amplitude on time for, for the signal under study, diagram of the probability distribution for a noise signal, scattered diagram of input parameters, clustering results. After the randomization, 
randomization procedure, the actual training control and test samples were selected in a ratio of two to one, that is 67% and 33%. The distance between the cluster practically coincide in each of the considered samples. Therefore, the training and test samples are representative. The neural network was trained by the above methods for 1000 epoch. The training accuracy characteristics in show in this figure. The steady state mean square error is 0. 382. All right, figure shows the results of uh, the neural network training validation test from which it can be seen that the average values of the gradient is and the optimal values of the training coefficient does not exceed one. The work carried out a number of additional studies that determine the influence of training parameters of the quality of the neural network, namely influence of the training rate coefficients, influence of the number of neurons in the hidden layer, influence of the delay length of input signal, influence of the number of training epoch based. The resulting figure shows the characteristics of the transient process in terms of free turbine frequency rotations, as well as according to the developed neural network. A left figure shows, uh, shows diagrams of change in the values of the coefficients of the PID controller during the transient process. As follows from the left figure, the transit process turns out to be very close to the reference process and the PID controller with a neural network provide a much higher quality of control, of control that PD controllers or various architectures. Right figure shows a diagram of the joint arrangement of the transient process curves according to the free turbine speed during the operation of various controllers. First table presents a numerical analysis of the quality of operation of the circuit for maintaining the free turbine speed with various co controllers. A comparative analysis of the accuracy provided to each of the considered controllers is given in second table, which shows the probabilities of the error of the first and second kind in deter determining the optimal free turbine frequency rotation parameters. The, con the conclusion presented in this slide. Thank you for attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a conclusion not so simple to read. <coughs> okay, maybe somebody have a question. Uh, it's uh, previously helicopters also used some systems of uh, uh, rotation stabilization. Analog, some analog, analogous systems. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yes. Analog, analogous systems was. Uh was developed in other in other works in other of the uh, other authors group with uh, the pd controller quadratic controller pd controller with a variable implication factor fuzzy logical controller the, there is, there are is analog these systems no no uh, i mean that uh, on uh operational uh, amplifiers. First picture on your report. We can see <clears throat> system of uh, automatic control of rotating, turbo shaft rotating control system. Maybe could you show us first your slide? Not first, but uh, first picture on your slide. 
and mm -hmm. you see uh, this is built on uh, analogous elements not digital system but analogous system auto after automatic control it could be built on uh, operational amplifiers do you know no 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 okay let it be uh, then you also shown that uh, um slide number number nine please show us number nine yes time seconds 20 40 seconds it's up to this 40 seconds uh, system try to uh, stabilize rotation of transition process it's very long process looks like yes yes yeah this uh, this very long process and uh, uh, and other research and other research the uh, and other research confirm confirm that uh, this uh, this process mm -hmm. I have I make a compar a comparative analysis of transit process in the in the right in the right figure uh, lay layer one one two three four five and six this uh, this this layer can confirms the the transition process with um, with PD regulator, PID regulator, fuzzy logic regulator. This is uh, pro this is process calculated be in other in other works in other authors group. But uh, but my new but neural network. This is uh, point. This is point seven. The oh, I mean shy. Mm -hmm reduce 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 it to may some seconds for transit process mm -hmm. it's your regulator is uh, point seven point seven point seven point seven without fluctuations okay looks better than others okay <clears throat> Thank you. Thank no you. Thank questions. you. No, no, any other questions? No. Okay. Thank you for your report, Dr. Vlado. Thank and, you. Uh, and for now, we have a coffee break up to 13 o'clock. Two o'clock by Kyiv time. Coffee break. Thank you very much. Thank you. Two o'clock cave time or one o'clock by Central European time, we will continue.
Okay, dear colleagues, we are ready to continue our machine learning section, second part. <clears throat> I see that you have Chichkarev already. Online. Yes, I'm ready. Yeah, and please, you can share your screen and we, we can start. Synthetic data set. Interesting. Good afternoon. Uh, you see my presentation? Yes, we see. Yes, the presentation. And handwritten Ukrainian chart recognition, user uh, convolutional viewer networks, and synthetic data set. The goal of this study is shown at slide. This study is devoted to this to researching the possibilities of recording Ukrainian handwritten letters using convolutional neural networks and analyzing the influence on of the selected neural neural networks uh, architecture on the accuracy and the reliability of recognition. In addition, the possibility of using a synthetic date set and the effect of augmentation on the original date set on, on the recognition results were investigated. It's very simple. If very simple, the question of this work is whether it's possible to use the printed fonts for recognizing and real right. handwritten letters. Mm -hmm. In this slide, you see the data set building. For some alphabets and languages, handwritten date set character have been de developed and published for train various models. For Latin letters, we have, for example, enhancing MNIST date set, widely known for 400 letters. There is well-known MNIST date set for Asian language, Bengali, Devanagari, Chinese, Arabic. There are also well-known date sets for handwritten recognition. For Kyrillic uh, letters, uh, a similar, similar date set is absent. For Ukrainian letters, uh, is absent too. And uh, we built date set from handwritten fonts. Uh, we change. Uh, Change image resolution, uh, uh, fonts, uh, and uh, number of classes uh, for dividing the letters. All images were preprocessed. The idea of preprocessed is at slide four. We are 
filter image to reduce noise, uh, binarize images uh, for letters, uh, for letters, um, for letter selection, use morphological transformations and uh, Contours, uh, contours uh, were selected to uh, change, uh, to set the uh, area of interest. Uh, some architectures of neural networks uh, is shown at slide five. The simplest architecture is number one, as uh, it's uh, in practice Lenet five architecture. And uh, more uh, more deep architecture is architecture six. Uh, is uh, it is VGG sixteen sixteen architecture for uh, one cha uh, one channel images. And the result uh, of training this uh, neural networks uh, is shown at slide seven and at slide eight. Is the, it's uh, the more complicated architecture. It's uh, the more simplest architecture. All networks uh, were trained by using Adam optimizer uh, and number of train epochs uh, was chosen to 50 for all vari variants of for all variants of architecture and uh, it is the result it is the um, example of results for uh, monochrome train images as you see, more deepest, more deep architecture has a, a um, has a best results. And at this slide, we have two: the more deep architecture has a the best results of of recognition for uh, real data. And at well, as preliminary uh, conclusion, models with a deeper architecture gave a much better results in recognizing for real inscriptions. But recognition errors were obtained on some samples of uh, inscriptions and when using deep architecture too. And the next stage of study, we have more advanced uh, variants of networks. Uh, and the impact of image resolution for training samples uh, on the recognition were compared. And if see the this uh, slide, the most uh, parameter is the size of uh, training samples. It has strongly effects uh, mm -hmm. on. Uh, results of character recognition. The recognition accuracy of the test date set after training all variants of the models was quite high. More than 90 and higher. However, the generation of training date sets of a small size, less of 500 images per class, practically did not provide any reliable recognition. 
and as you see the generation 1000 and half images per letter or number uh, it's um, the limit for acceptable recognition accuracy reducing the sample size uh, the data set size lead to a significant decrease in recognition accuracy if uh, uh, for real in, for real in uh, real inscriptions if you have a training model at least uh, uh, one thousand at half the accuracy near 100 percent if uh, the size of uh, data set near some hundreds we have uh, accuracy at level near 50 percent an increase uh, in the size of sample leads to noticeable increase in the time spent on train and model and and the next stage uh, next stage next stage of investigated we uh, change the number of classes for for date set and uh, as uh, enhanced amnist date set have uh, only letters uh, without uh, um, cases uppercase or lowercase and uh, example of uh, architectures for uh, for example, ResNet family is on slide 13. It's an uh, example for recognition uh, numbers and letters of Ukrainian. It's uh, well results all uh, letters uh, were recognized all red letters uh, uh, and numbers were recognized quite well and it's uh, result uh, what how many images per class uh, on train for training that said uh, is uh, quite well for recognition the recognition accuracy of real descriptions uh, is uh, some is not quite high it's example uh, the errors uh, were little if uh, number of image per class one thousand uh, and half and more the increase of number of neural compare different model architectures all the options considered show the recognition accuracy of the test set more than 99 percent the training on a data set of sufficient volume an increase is the number of samples in the training date set for 
all considered architectures led to increase in recognition accuracy. An example of the experimental results for the model with mobile network architecture is at slide 15 and, and slide 14. And the recognition accuracy of real inscription uh, with a training sample size at least 700 and preferably 1500 images per class. <clears throat> Increasing the resolution of the training sample images had little effect uh, on the results due to saturation. It's true at slide 16. An increase in the resolution of images of training sample provides a slight increase in the recognition accuracy, but the effect is not achieved on all architectures and may practically not appear. However, with an increase in the resolution of the training sample, the time spent on training increased quite significantly by more than in one order of magnitude. And uh, it's the conclusions for all work. In practice, if you uh, want to, to recognize handwritten letters, the volume of data set must be quite big, at least uh, 1,000 and half uh, images per class. It's all thanks for your attention. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Shichkaryo. Maybe Thank somebody you. have questions to, to report. I have one question, please. Please, please. Uh, could you please reopen uh, the ninth slide? Ninth slide. Yes. With the table of accuracy. Ninth slide. Yes. Share, share screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Share. Mm -hmm. Yes. Here uh, in architecture five, uh, Abiyev instead of Abiyev, one letter is not recognized, but accuracy score is 100%. Sorry, it's. Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's error. Uh, <laughs> I must to, to write uh, ye. Sorry, okay. it's error. It's uh, ye Ukrainsky Pavin Nabut. No, the result is uh, correct, but uh, the representation is not correct. Yeah, representation yeah. is yeah. error. I'm Thank sorry. You. Uh, but uh, what? unexpected result it's all results quite uh, expected that more uh, data set better result it's um, obvious result is not oh, unexpected oh, uh, not Nobel Prize For better result, we must uh, first first result uh, build the Ukrainian handwritten data set, and uh, for two 
you need um, if you want uh, the good results uh, and work with uh, synthetic data set uh, from letters uh, from um, fonts the uh, volume of this data set is at least uh, thousand and half uh, or two thousands uh, of uh, images per class yeah but you mentioned synthetic data sets uh, nothing about how you generate this uh, synthetic data set uh, here nothing mentioned about generator of synthetic data set Generator, we use uh, the ability of TensorFlow data set generator. And uh, uh, for da data augmentation, we uh, change uh, rotation, uh, change zoom, and uh, uh, change. Understand, but uh, could be our fitting using such no, say, no? from uh, all architectures we used we uh, in practice all abilities uh, of tensorflow and keras uh, we are uh, trained uh, and and investigated mm. one experiment was with uh, Over, overfitted. Oh, yes, yes, overfitted. At one experiments from uh, uh, some hundred. Mm -hmm. In practice, we now have some overfitted. Results. We are fitting. Okay. Thank you very much. Maybe. Thank you. Some other questions? No questions. Thank you, Dr. Shishkarev, for your report. And we are going to the next report. Anatoly Treguba, Oksana Malanchuk, who is present. Oksana Malanchuk, very good. Yeah, we see your. your PowerPoint. Medical University. But not listen. Uh, sound. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, dear, particip dear participants, let me introduce you our presentation, Prediction of the Duration of Inpatient Treatment of Diabetes in Children uh, based on neural networks. Uh, today, in all spheres of life and activity, people use the knowledge obtained from data. Uh, this also applies to medicine and its areas, which is a priority area in various countries of the world. The number of certain uh, types of disease is increasing, and one of them is diabetes. The use of neural networks to predict the duration of a patient treatment for diabetes can help medical professionals determine the most effective treatment methods, provide effective planning of treatment projects, and analyze their effectiveness. Uh, the purpose of the work is to substantial the knowledge by the provide a prediction of the duration of patient treatment of diabetes in children based on the use of the developed neural network model of direct communication. Uh, to achieve the goal, uh, the following task should be solved. Uh, propose uh, an approach and uh, prepare data for predicting the duration of a patient treatment of diabetes in children and justify the parameters of neural networks model of direct communication for predicting the duration of a patient treatment of diabetes and uh, to evaluate uh, and uh, accuracy indicators. Uh, we present the main stages 
of developing uh, a model for predicting the duration of a patient treatment of diabetes in children based on the use of neural networks of direct communication. The stage of forming a database on the treatment of diabetes in children is key to the successful uh, development of a model for predicting the duration of a patient treatment. One method of data collection is the use of electronic medical records data. With the help of electronic medical records, 779 instances of data of inpatient treatment uh, from Lviv of diabetes in children. We clean the data and filled um, in the missing values. Based on the result in this uh, stage, data were prepared and uh, a fragment of uh, which is presented in the table. Uh, at the next stage, the input parameters of the model uh, for predicting the duration of inpatient treatment of diabetes in children are determined based on the use of neural networks of direct communication. This step consists um, in selecting the attributes most, most correlated with the uh, target attribute bad days using a correlation matrix. For each input uh, factor, according to the table, we find their average value. After that, we calculate the correlation matrix, the elements of which are determined in uh, the formula tree. Uh, the co um, covariance between the input factor and the uh, target attribute is determined by the formula for. Uh, correlation matrix uh, displays the relationship between attribute in a data set. For the target attribute bad day, the correlation with each other attribute was calculated using formula three. The obtained result uh, are presented in table. Used on the data in table two, it should be noted that most of the attributes have a weak correlation with the bad day attribute, and uh, this suggests that um, they should not be used and as input uh, parameter of a neural network model. As a result of data cleaning, we built a correlation matrix in the form of a thermal diagram, which reflect uh, the input parameters of the model. In our research, it's uh, accepted that the architecture of the model is chosen according to the features of the uh, requirements for the task of predicting the duration of inpatient treatment of diabetes. Uh, in this case, a model with a simple neural networks with a variable number of high layer having 64 neurons is adopted. It, it's known that this architecture of the neural network model can be effective if there is not a lot of data and they have a sufficiently uh, simple structure. In addition, our research compared model from two to several layers. It's uh, impractical to increase their number to avoid uh, retraining the model. The following conclusion can be drawn from the table three. Uh, the slowest to uh, learn was model four, which learned at uh, three milliseconds per step, while all other models learned at two milliseconds per step. Model six and seven uh, were slows of 0 0.0469 and 0 0.465 res respectively, have the best lost indicators on uh, test data. The worst performance was shown uh, by model three with a learning speed of two milliseconds per step and loss on the test data of 0 0.0498. In general, we can say that the learning speed of the model doesn't uh, always correlate with its accuracy. Uh, so it's necessary to pay attention uh, to the final indicator on the test data, which is presented in figure. Uh, it was established that uh, all variants of the studied models have a fairly low losses, which indicates their effectiveness. It's also important to pay attention to the difference between the loss on the training and test data. Based on the um, obtained dependencies, it was established that the best results are shown by model two, uh, which is sufficient, uh, sufficient for learning uh, 50 epochs. 
Uh, all other models are subject to overtraining, and model two has the parameter presented in table. Uh, based on the research result, it was established that the model with the smallest value shown the best result. Therefore, the proposed rational uh, neural network model of forward communication for predicting the duration of inpatient treatment of diabetes in children has an architecture consisting of two layers. The first is the dense type with 64 neurons uh, and the ReLU activation function. And the second is the dense type and one neuron. The total number of model parameters is 385. In the proposed model, uh, the learning rate is 0 0.0001. Uh, this value is set experimentally and uh, is small, which can help uh, avoid divergence or scaling uh, of the model. Uh, the proposed approach to predicting the duration of inpatient treatment of diabetes in children is based on the use of forward propagation neural networks and involves nine stages. The peculiarity of this approach is that the formation of database and knowledge is carried out based on taking into account the peculiarities of inpatient treatment projects thanks to the computer analysis of historical data and the execution of uh, simulations. This ensures a uh, systematic consideration of the um, interrelationship between the factors and the duration of inpatient treatment of diabetes in children. The described um, approach is the basis of qualitative data pre preparation and increase of accuracy of neural network models for predicting the duration of inpatient treatment of diabetes in uh, children. Uh, based on the use of developed approach, as well as using the prepared data, uh, the parameters of the neural network model of direct, direct communication for predicting the duration of inpatient treatment of diabetes were substantiated uh, and its accuracy indicator were evaluated. The proposed rational fit forward neural network model for predicting the duration of inpatient treatment of diabetes in children has an uh, architecture that involves two layers. The first is the uh, dense type with 64 neurons and the ReLU activation function. And the second is the dense type and one neuron. Uh, the total number of model parameters is 385. In the proposed model for any uh, rate is 0.0001. Future uh, research should be conducted on the development, development of a decision support system that will provide a solution to the problem of planning diabetes uh, treatment project in children using a valid fit forward neural networks model to predict the duration of their inpatient treatment. The report is over. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Maybe somebody have a question to Dr. Molanchuk. I have a question. Please. How did you calculate the correlation between uh, quality and uh, numerical uh, parameters. variables? Your input data is a mixing of categorical, such as, such as uh, human hand, female or male, and numerical continuous variables. If, uh, yes. Uh, yes, we put zero, for example, it uh, it was girl, for and we put one if it was boy, uh, and. Uh, I understand, but it is not correct. When you calculate correlation between a categorical and continuous variable, you must use such uh, so-called uh, dummy variables. Because if you uh, code as a female zero and male one, you may obtain positive correlation. But if uh, you reverse coding use, 
then the correlation between uh, will be uh, reversed. Positive or negative, depending zero one or one zero. You uh, used uh, so-called naive statistics approach when uh, we did not make uh, difference between categorical and uh, numerical continuous variables. We take into account uh, differ different uh, parameters uh, such as uh, department, uh, temperature, um, yes, higher. I understand that, that is higher mass, gender, uh, white, white uh, and what is uh, the what is the correlation between temperature and gender? Uh, no, we we, um, we find that um, if uh, children has diabetes, uh, um, temperature uh, we don't have correlation with temperature. Because uh, temperature don't uh, have effect uh, uh, with, with this treatment. I, I simply uh, ask you to take into account this uh, point. It's wrong. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I also want to ask, you used 385 parameters, input parameters. Is it looks too much to estimate one result uh, expected duration of treatment. 385 parameters. We had, we had um, parameters for 779 maybe patient and uh, for, for each uh, patient, uh, we had uh, different parameters, yes, different parameters. And um, this 385 parameters is um, um, dependence between, between other um, parameters of, of treatment. So, one factor analysis should be used to decrease number of effective parameters. Would you repeat how much patients? 779. Uh, and uh, we see yeah. two, two patients uh, per uh, one parameter. No, no. Uh, for regression, it's no, very, no. very small. Different, different para uh, number of parameters for different patients, as I understand. Yes, we take, yeah. we take um, all information about about uh, patient uh, during uh, five years. Seven hundred patients. Uh, per, uh, Seven hundred patients. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And uh, uh, four hundred parameters, around it. Around yeah. In regression, we must have size uh, at least ten uh, size uh, ten uh, times of parameters. Three thousands and seventeen fifty. You have uh, uh, you have not statistical significance for this result. Uh, for each patient, we had uh, a, a lot of parameters for each no, patient. No, 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 no uh, not for per patient. You, uh, the size of data set must be at least 10 times more than the set of parameters. You have the 300 parameters, you must 3,000 patients. Yeah, you're right. Okay, uh, let me go in uh, to the... Maybe you should discuss uh, somewhere outside timeline, and we should go to the next reporter. S thank you. Maybe some other questions. Uh, no questions. We should have keep in time. Thank you, Dr. Malanchuk.
interesting result, but we need to go to the next report. Olga Cherenichenko already ready. Who will who will um, report? Okay. Hello. Uh, I hope you see my presentation. Dr. Chernichenko, yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, today, I'd like to present the results of our research related to collaborative business intelligence, especially uh, about the virtual assistant uh, that can help to organize such kind of activity. And uh, today, I'm as a representative of uh, international team with uh, my colleague Fakat uh, Mohammad. Uh, we are now work uh, together on the project, the business intelligence for people. And uh, today, I'd like to say a little bit about the background of our research and um, also about uh, questions uh, uh, we try to research and uh, present our ideas about collaborative business intelligence virtual assistant. So uh, the main aim of um, the project is to bring uh, the power of uh, warehousing and uh, all up into uh, interactive analysis to the largest possible audience uh, by implementing the data warehousing process in uh, software as a service mode from multi-source heterogeneous data integration to very simple analysis and data visualization. It means uh, that we presuppose that anybody can um, use such kind of services and especially non-expert uh, users can uh, ask uh, the services to explore the data. Collaborative business intelligence uh, involves using social networks, uh, quizzes, brainstorming, uh, and even simple chat between two or three co-workers uh, to collectively solve problems. And the main idea um, of our uh, research is uh, to collect people in one virtual space and encourage them to leave their comment or opinion for general purposes. Uh, in this case, uh, general business intelligence can be called like collaborative business intelligence. And the main issue in this case for us and, uh, is um, about how we can encourage people to communicate each other, to uh, share the ideas uh, during the exploration process. So uh, mostly we focus on the development of collaborative business intelligence framework and uh, um, in this uh, research in terms of conversational assistant concept. And uh, we research the following questions. Firstly, can a virtual assistant uh, like a chatbot using uh, a conversational interface helps uh, simplify the data exploration process for non-experts? And secondly, what features of uh, such kind of virtual assistant are most important in assigning users who have limited knowledge? Of course, you know that uh, chatbots uh, provide a lot of benefits uh, and uh, mostly we can underline um, the such kind of, uh, they can support the customers around the clock. Uh, they resolve problems really fast. Uh, they can organize balance uh, automation with human touch and so on. And also uh, there are a lot of uh, well examples of chatbots we know and uh, if you can see on this slide, um, some examples uh, as that well known. Uh, I don't want to uh, tell a lot about this. 
Uh, why chatbots are so popular? Because of the efficiency, because of uh, personalization, scalability, and also about uh, the availability. That is why we think that such kind of tools that helps us to organize collaborative process can be a virtual assistant uh, like a chatbot. General pipeline can be represented like on this slide. We start with a user request or user input, and then we need to uh, process this uh, request uh, in order to uh, generate the response. And during this process, we need some uh, very um, uh, common stages and we need to decide how to realize it. It, it. it means we need a model for natural language understanding. We need to model dialogue state tracking and also we need to have dialogue policy. Uh, as well, we need the model for natural language generation. And this part uh, uh, for our um, opinion uh, can organize for us this framework to communicate uh, our system with uh, users. But inside the system, we have uh, another kind of problems. Uh, of course, we have a lot of uh, tools to realize chatbots and very uh, useful uh, language model. And um, in our future work, I think we will try to uh, research them and uh, compare and uh, but just for now we understand that we have a lot of uh, real uh, opportunities to realize this part like communicate com communication between users and uh, our uh, collaborative units. We can uh, represent the main workflow that we research, like uh, is depicted on the slide. You can see we have users, and uh, after the user provides some request, we need to uh, identify this request. It means uh, we need to classify whether we uh, we need some extra information. In this case, we. Uh, should uh, uh, ask a user uh, to provide some additional data, or we can identify what kind of comment uh, in terms of um, data exploration a user uh, requested from us. Then we identify the comment and we need to uh, execute around this comment, and the result we will show uh, for users like a visualization. So we think that our users is not expert and uh, he or she um, doesn't uh, do that exploration process uh, correctly, but uh, he wondering uh, in some information about data and uh, he wants to explore data. So uh, he formulate his um, request in natural language. That is why we need this uh, unit uh, to understand uh, natural language. And also we need to uh, have some unit to organize communication with this user in natural language. But uh, from the other side, we need another module that uh, should be realized process uh, for request identification, uh, command classification, and also to run such kind of commands. We investigate uh, uh, the task uh, in the during the following phase, uh, uh, phases. So, the firstly, we need to identify the domain for collaborative BI. Then uh, we need to have, of course, some data sources. And it means that we can have uh, not only one data source, where we can combine different da data sources. And it is uh, one of the tasks in our project. Uh, then uh, we need some kind of knowledge base because we need to, um, we want actually to research uh, uh, how our user, um, the behaviors of our user and uh, um, at the end provide some recommendations for new users or for new uh, data research. 
then uh, such kind of step like visualization and processing and summarizing uh, as well, we think we need to realize. And uh, this time we mostly focus on the pre-processing steps. We started with loading data, then we explore them, uh, create metadata and uh, try to um, uh, research how we can generate command and match commands with expressions uh, that we receive from users like a request. And uh, the result of this process should be the prompt that we can uh, use uh, for a generative model uh, to generate uh, um, some expression in natural language to communicate with the user. Uh, on this slide, you can see very general steps uh, about data exploration. And uh, we think that we need to help for our user to go through these steps, actually. And for our experimenting, we choose the data set of road accidents in France. It is uh, open source and we can uh, use it for our experimenting. And, uh, uh, also, uh, we try to um, understand what kind of request can be uh, from users to such kind of data. Uh, here you can see some examples, uh, for example, uh, exploring uh, accidents according to the date, we can ask uh, the services about the uh, number of accidents per year or something like this. Uh, it means uh, that uh, we presuppose that some users ask uh, questions for us and our system should recognize these um, uh, questions, understand what kind of comment we need to uh, realize in order to provide appropriate information. Uh, the example of such kind of conversation you can see on this slide. For example, user can ask us what weather has the most accident. And uh, the result uh, of processing this expression, our system, based on um, metadata we pre uh, prepare with in advance, uh, we can understand that it is a really match to the column uh, uh, like uh, atmospheric condition in our data set. And as a result, our system uh, generate the um, question to the user, do you want to explore an atmospheric condition related to the accidents? And if it is yes, uh, we provide um, some kind of uh, command and uh, provide the results for, for the users. So uh, when we uh, investigate the result and uh, after then we show users uh, um, some visualization, for example, like diagram you can see on this slide, and ask a uh, user to um, comment uh, to annotate uh, the results. It can be like you see, you can see here, like normal weather has the most accidents, and it caused because uh, normal weather is the most frequent type of weather. And we collect such kind of comments and uh, we're supposed to use uh, them in future to make um, recommendations uh, for the next uh, users, what kind of, of uh, exploration, uh, data exploration they can do with the service. Inside the system, we try to build the uh, syntax tree uh in order to understand what kind of uh, command we need to run and uh, for the example uh, of a simple dialogue uh, you saw previously uh, the syntax tree you can see here so uh, in in this case we need the only um, two kind of uh, data we need actually the data set uh, from uh, what we um, uh, ask for information and uh, uh, the column uh, to run this um, command uh, to, to calculate uh, uh, how many 
unique uh, items you have. Uh, so the, uh, the idea here is to uh, firstly uh, to understand uh, the expression in uh, natural language that we receive as a request from the user. Then uh, identify the command and according to the command uh, and according to the syntax tree we have for this command, we ask uh, additional questions for our users and uh, clarify uh, some parameters and after then we run this uh, uh, command and uh, we can show the results for the users. So uh, to summarize uh, my presentations uh, today, I'd like to say that it is really a very first steps of uh, our research and um, but we understand that uh, such kind of tool like virtual system as um, chatbot or maybe conversational agent uh, can really help us uh, to organize this collaborative uh, procedure and involve uh, users uh, to collaborative analysis. Uh, and it is the real, the main um, aim for us. And our future work, we plan to implement the prototype and uh, play with it uh, in order to understand how it helps uh, uh, people, uh, users uh, to receive uh, uh, results, to how it helps to uh, receive their answer uh, uh, during uh, the exploration process. Uh, that's all that I'd like to say for today. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions, I understand, mm. but uh, very short questions because we well, are, short. We yes. Fine. How many people uh, works on this uh, project? Uh, I am. I don't uh, know actually uh, how many people exactly, but for this part, we work uh, together with my colleague, uh, Pahat. Uh, he's postdoc uh, in this lab, and uh, this is a result of our uh, two, uh, both of uh, two people research. And but, analysis, but, but, but in project, we have a lot of work packages. And, syntax uh, analysis one and statistical analysis the second, and so on. Yes, that? Yeah. They yeah. are very overloaded. That is why we uh, have uh, so simple results for now, but uh, very perspective is for me. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your report. And now we give the word to Rostislav Yurimets. We seen him today. I, I suspect that it will be autom automation. <laughs> yes, yes. In modern economic conditions, the problems of formation and effective use of the potential opportunities of the hotel business occupy a special place, and the management of the potential of the hotel business and the justification of measures for its development to increase efficiency and competitiveness are of interest to both to scientists and practitioners. It is important to identify the elements of the potential of the hotel business that affect the economic development of the country and to establish quantitative and qualitative relations between individual components of the business development potential. The paper aims to develop a factor econometric model 
influencing hotel business potential on economic growth in Ukraine and its practical approbation, namely to determine the components that have the maximum impact on the country's GDP. In the process of research, it was established that the main indicators that characterize the potential of the hotel business and have an impact on the economic development of Ukraine are income from hotels services provided and similar accommodation, operating and other costs of hotels and similar accommodation, the living area of all hotels rooms and similar accommodation, the fixed assets degree of depreciation. To create an econometric model, an analysis of statistical data characterizing the hotel business in Ukraine for the period from 2012 to 2021 years is carried out. It is necessary to build a forecast function for all determined model factors to implement the GDP forecast due to the developed econometric model. The factors that shape the potential of the hotel business were selected. As a result of the analysis and econometric dependence is obtained. The forecast indicators characterizing the level of income from services provided in hotels and similar accommodations for a short period of time here made using the Box Jenkins method. The Box and Jenkins process used makes it possible to build a fairly accurate and adequate short-term forecasting model. But due to the non-stationary to building a more accurate long-term forecast, this method requires improvement and study of the time series. The resulting multiple regression data for the income indicator from hotel services provided and similar accommodation is shown in Figure 3. The parameters estimating the result of the, of the econometrics model for the indicator income from hotel services provided and similar accommodation are presented in figure 5. According to the obtained parameters, the developed multi-factor model will look as follows. The resulting multiple regression data for the GDP amount indicator are shown in the figure 3. The estimating parameters results of the econometric model in the indicated GDP amount are presented in figure 8. According to the obtained parameters, the development multi-factor model will look like this. The econometric model is used to forecast the impact of operating and other cost and living space of all hotels rooms 
and similar accommodation impact on the income from services provided in hotels and similar accommodations. The econometric model is used to forecast the impact of operating and the other cost of hotels and similar accommodations on the level of GDP. The development and implementation of innovations and the latest technological advances play an important role in the competitive market of the hotel sector, ensuring the compliance of hotel companies with European standards. The newest components size of the hotel logistics confirms the importance and complexity of the business entities. Ukraine needs to create hotel type enterprises that can compete with high economic performance branded hotels and ensure logistics improvement. The developed model allowed us to identify the components of the hotel business potential that can contribute to the increase of GDP predict the growth of Ukraine. The obtained results show that the level of Ukraine's GDP is in expected to decrease gradually in the future. The calculations indicate that stimulating the growth of the hotel business will have a positive impact on the growth of Ukraine's GDP. Therefore, the implication of machine learning methods can facilitate well-informed decisions regarding the future activities of the hotel business. Thank you. That's all, yes? Yes, that's all. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Any questions from participants? <clears throat> no questions. Thank you for your report. We're going to next report. Oleg Basestyuk, Zoriana Repchak. Anybody present? No present. Okay. Now then, Lesia Muchurat, Roman Blahar, Natalia Reverenda. Yeah, Let's I'm move. present. Roman uh, okay, okay. Please tell me if you can see the demonstration. Yes, we, all, we see your presentation. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Roman, and I am here today to present our work on identification and tracking of unmanned aero vehicles based on radar data. And this research was, was conducted by Alessia Michurat, Natalia Revranda, and myself. With your permission, I will start. Please. Problem statement. The problem of effective counteraction to the legal use of UAVs has become particularly relevant. After all, the drone industry is actively developing, but there is no universal method of combating it. The relative accessibility and ease of use of drones makes them a convenient tool and uh, potential target for illegal abuse. Therefore, the aim of our work is to develop an algorithm to solve the problem of correct identification and tracking of UAVs based on data obtained from radars and sensors. Literature, literature review. Uh, we have analyzed uh, the most relevant research on this topic. Here's a summary of the main information. The fight against the illegal use of drones is divided into two stages, tracking and neutralization. There are four main means of detection, radar, acoustic, optical, and radio frequency, but each of them has significant drawbacks. To, to eliminate them, integrated systems are used. 
In addition, significant progress has been made in image processing and computer vision over the past uh, decade. Modern technologies make it possible to detect objects in video stream and an image as well as to classify them. This technology can potentially be used in this task. The further research task in this paper is to develop an algorithm and design an automated uh, system to solve the problem of tracking and identifying drones based on data from radars and photo or video cameras. The developed software should process this radar data and analyze images using artificial intelligence. Input and output data. As mentioned before, the input data sources are radar measurement and the image provided by the camera. Since this information arrives simultaneously and needs immediate processing, we consider this stage parallel in the proposed algorithm. The input data are the special coordinates and uh, speed of the observed object, which are received from radar with a certain frequency, as well as the image received from the camera, which is presented in the form, form of two-dimensional array of RGB vectors. The data coming from the radar has some noise. Uh, the for, the, the, for their further use, it is necessary to localize these trajectories to bring them closer to the real indicators. Images are analyzed by AI methods to obtain the useful information within the defined task. In this study is a classification for object identification. The further output data of the proposed system are localized special coordinates and information about the type of the observed object. Proposed algorithm. The tracking procedure can be described as iterative process. Um, probing by the locator occurs with a certain frequency, so we will consider each radar cycle and iteration. Di data is sent from the radar to the system at each iteration. Uh, they are transferred to the system component responsible for their processing, namely localization. In parallel with this, an image of observed sector which contains a detected object is received from the camera. It is proposed to use the Kalman filter to solve the localization problem. Uh, object identification within this frame within this works framework is reduced to a binary classification of the input image using convolutional neural networks. For practical use, CNN requires a preliminary training stage. The development of the classification module starts with the training of the model. Since this work solves the problem of binary classification of images, therefore the data set for training consists of two classes of images, drone, drones and birds. Uh, and you can see the architecture of the neural network in the image on the right. Experiment and results. First, let's look at the task of localization. The localization task includes two stages. Uh, the first is data generation. We generate a data set that would simulate the measurement of uh, the locator. We took the files of drone flight logs. The flight logs contain time sample geographic coordinates of drone throughout the entire flight trajectory. Then uh, noise was added to this data to simulate the radar measurement error. The second stage is applying the Kalman filter to the generated data and measuring the error to evaluate the result. For each uh, file with noisy radar measurements, we will find the root mean square, square error uh, relative to the true trajectory. We will perform the same operation for the localized da data, which will allow for further comparison in, in the before-after format. The result of the calculation are shown in table one. Then the model was trained and its accuracy was evaluated. The estimates of class prediction by several metrics are shown in table two. Uh, this slide visualizes how the system works. Uh, to do this, we generated a fragment that simulates radar measurements when drone is detected and also took several frames from the drone flight video as data coming from the camera. Conclusions. Uh, <clears throat> the developed system can serve as a starting point for creating a full fluid tool to counteract the missions of drones. The main direction for further research are solving the problem of tracking and identifying several objects in the monitored sector simultaneously and modernization of the classifier to identify the type or model of the detected drone. Thank you for, for your attention. 
Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, what about precision of your identification and uh, tracking the drones? Some measurements. Uh, what do you mean about precision? Uh, you tracking your drones, yeah? And uh, yeah. you see drone bird. Um, okay, and then when some drone is on the field of radar, you can track radar data and uh, yeah you're right mm -hmm. input data is radar data uh, and uh, photo or video from camera in parallel yes mm -hmm. and simultaneous processing in yes. using Kalman filtering uh, yes for localized uh, uh, radar data to to distinguish uh, bird or drone uh, to track the trajectory of uh, observed object mm -hmm. thank you maybe other questions some somebody want to ask anything no question thank you for your report interesting thank you for your Very attention important now. Next, we have similar Lesia Mucurat, Ostap Vasil Matviyev. Yeah, I'm here. Ostap. I hope that you can see my screen yes, and hear yes, me good. Yes. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Today, I want to present you our assessment about acute based algorithm for the dialogue position determination in mobile robotics. Uh, so let's start with the problem statement. Autonomous localization and environment perception are essential for a mobile robot to perform high-level tasks. As for robot localization, odometry and inertial sensors cannot avoid the problem, problem of error accumulation. Therefore, extraceptive sensors must be used to achieve eff effective localization and mapping. Among various external sensors, two-dimensional laser sensors can provide accurate and reliable environmental information with a wide viewing angle. They are widely used in a perceptual task, including localization, mapping, and the place recognition. The problem of determining the LIDAR position with optimal accuracy and in an acceptable time is relevant in various fields of application. Examples include smart houses as uh, robot vacuum cleaners, also vehicle route planning, dynamic map construction, collision avoidance, atmospheric research, cartography, economic efficiency management, and etc. As known, the particle filter, filter algorithm solves the problem above. However, the number of reading iterations after each movement is significant if the LIDAR moves many times in space. Accordingly, the execution time of this algorithm increases several times. That is, it is impossible to deceive, decide in real time. One of the options for solving this problem is the development of a parallel algorithm and its optimization using CUDA technology and the graphics processor of the NVIDIA video card. So our purpose of this study is to optimize the LIDAR localization algorithm using CUDA technologies the object of research is an algorithm of particle filter for LIDAR localization, and the subject of research is CUDA technologies for parallelization of algorithm code. Uh, nowadays, various issues of robotics are increasingly researched. There are many articles that talk about different ways to improve localization using GPS sensors and various cameras. There are articles comparing different technologies such as MPI, OpenMP, OpenCL, and uh, CUDA. And there is also an article that discusses the parallelization of the algorithm particle filter based on OpenMP technologies. OpenMP parallel computing technology is used to optimize the computing process in order to accelerate it and provide real-time results. As a result, they also managed to speed up the computational process by about eight times and achieve an efficiency of 0.97. After conducting a detailed analysis of the problem considered in our work, 
It was noted that no one has optimized the particle filter, filter algorithm using QDA technologies. So let's consider the algorithm in more detail. LIDAR successfully performs two actions, scans the space around itself and moves in space by the vector with some margin of error. It is also important whether the initial position of the LIDAR is specified. If so, then we can fill the array of particles with the coordinates of that position. But if not, then we need to generate a certain numbers, which we set of particles that will be placed randomly in our premises. This is done using ray tracing algorithm. The idea of the algorithm is to count the numbers of intersection of the room walls with a ray emitted from a point horizontally to the right. If their number is even, then the point does not lie in the space. And the point is suitable if the intersection number is odd. You can see it on the figure. Uh, so first we set the coordinates of the verticals of our room. After that, depending on what, whether the initial position is specified, we fill the array with random particles of, or particles with the initial position coordinates. The next step will be a LIDAR scan of the surrounding spaces. Surrounding space, you can see it on the figure. The scan takes place k times, starting the movement horizontally and to the right, and each measurement differs from the previous one by an angle that changes by 360 divided by k degrees. This way, we get an array with the distances from the LIDAR to the room's walls with a given ray launch angle. Next, we calculate the weights for each particle. The calculation is as follows. First, we take the first particle of the array, then we calculate the angle relative to the horizontal, the final coordinate of the end of the segment, which starts in the particle coordinates and has the ray length from the ray. You can see it, uh, the formula here, where alpha is the ray angle and L is ray length. Then we calculate the perpendicular length lowered from the end of the segment to the nearest room wall. Then we add the square of the length of the perpendicular to the temporary variable. Then we repeat steps from two to four for each ray in the array. Then we need to uh, determine the weights of our particle, which are calculated according to the normal distribution formula like this, where mu is mathematical expectation and sigma is standard deviation that are set by LIDAR parameters. And then we need to repeat steps from one to six for each particle. Uh, the next step is to repopulate the particles uh, based on their waste, the procedure is divided into the four, sta four stages. The first stage is to add up all the values of particle weight. The second stage is to fill up, to fill the new array of weights with values equal to this, where S is sum of all values, thus we normalize them so that their sum is equal to one. The third stage is to fill in the, an array that has a value like this. In this way, we will get an array of weight intervals. And the fourth stage is uh, the generation of random value from zero to one. Then we need to determine which range in the weight array the number belongs to. And the index of the range of that range would correspond to the particle that should be created. Uh, the complexity of algorithm described above can be calculated as this, where n is the number of LIDAR movement iterations, K is the number of measurements at every step, R is the number of walls in the room, and Q is the number of generated particles. As a result, it grows very rapidly. One of the methods of optimizing this algorithm can be the parallelization of certain particles, particles of the code. Uh, for the most part, the most time is spent on the calculation of weights and repopulation, so these stages of the algorithm are parallelized. Thus, the complexity of the algorithm should be significantly reduced. To reduce the implementation time and increase the algorithm efficiency, we will compare the algorithm execution time to a different number of processor threads using OpenMP technology. And we will also make the time measurements on the graphics processor using CUDA technology. So for CUDA technology, some weights calculation functions are defined as global, which indicates that this code passage will be performed on the graphics processor. Additionally, calc weights method will cause auxiliary functions, which will be de defined as device. It means that only a graphics processor can cause and perform such functions. Uh, 
Numerous experiments are conducted on a graphics card well, with four multiprocessor blocks that can perform 512 threads. The function for determining the block size is Q the occupancy max potential block size, which in which is a heuristic manner calculates uh, the block size that reaches maximum occupancy. The thread group is called the CUDA block. Each CUDA block is performed by one multiprocessor and cannot be transferred to other multiprocessor in GPU. One multiprocessor can perform several simultaneous CUDA blocks depending on the resources required by CUDA blocks. Each core is performed on one device and CUDA supports several cores on one device at a time. In this way, we call calculates function passing grid size and block size as parameters. Here, block size is the number of threads on the block determined by the CUDA occupancy max potential block size function, and the grid size is the number of blocks uh, we calculate by the formula like this, uh, where n is the size of the array. In our case, it is the number of particles we will generate. Generate, sorry. Uh, so. Let's talk about input data and, ex and experiments. Uh, this section will feature tables and figures showing the program's time, speed, and efficiency with the different number of threads. The input, the input was taken from AlgoTester. Here uh, on the figure, you can see the example of input data, where we can see at the first row is the number of walls, then their coordinates, and uh, next row of uh, two numbers. First is the number of moves of LIDAR, and the second number is uh, number of measurements on each step. Next, three numbers are standard deviations, and we can see that our initial po position is given, and coordinates are 1 and 1. And then we can see measurements of LIDAR and vector on which LIDAR has moved. The program was tested for four different input variations with varying group shapes, the number of walls, iterations of LIDAR, and the number of measurements at every step. Uh, 3000 is the number of particles was selected for the most accurate localization. Uh, table 1 presents the execution time of a sequential and proposed parallel algorithm based on OpenMP technology in evaluation of the threads number 2, 4, and 8, and the values obtained by the acceleration and efficiency of our parallelization without this distribution between threads. K and NM are the input data described above. TS is the time of performing a sequential algorithm. TP1 is the time of execution of the parallel algorithm based on OpenMP technology. S is acceleration and E is efficiency. Analyzing the results of the first table, we see that when performing an algorithm with two threads, acceleration was obtained close to two and efficiency also goes to one. Since numerous experiments were conducted on a four core processor, we have received reliable results. Acceleration with four threads was appro approximately 3.5 and efficiency 0.89. When using eight threads, it was possible to improve the acceleration and bring it closer to 5.6. However, the efficiency decreased significantly and was only 0.7. All this is because the number of threads is uh, in the last two cores cases exceeds the number of cores in the multi-core computer system. The results can be significantly improved by cho choosing computers with small cores. Still, the results obtained should have the same trend between the number of cores and the variation of the threads number. On table two are presented the same results on the basis of CUDA technology and the graphics processor. Here, TP2 is the time of parallel algorithm based on CUDA technology. In table two, acceleration is close to 20, and it is known that when using QD technology, the performance is not calculated. Therefore, the proposed parallel algorithm has improved about four times the acceleration based on QDA technology compared to OpenMP technology. Uh, the results of tables one and two for visual analysis are presented in figure one. On figure two is presented acceleration, and on figure three, is presented efficiency obtained based on OpenMP technology for different number of threads, two, four, and eight, and based on CUDA technology. Uh, in conclusion, in conclusions, so we propose an investigative parallel algorithm for determining the current LIDAR position using CUDA technologies. The result of using OpenMP technologies are also compared. 
As a result, it was possible to speed up the process uh, about twice times and achieve the efficiency of 0.99. The algorithm is accelerated almost four times and the efficiency of 0.98 was obtained. Uh, and the acceleration was reached approximately 19.8 by using CUDA technologies for parallel programming. Better results can be achieved in the future based of the, on the proposal proposed parallel algorithm using more powerful computing system. On figure is presented the configuration of the computer on which the numerical experiments were performed. Uh, here are some references which were, were used uh, in our research and that's all. Thank you for attention and if you have some question, please ask. Thank you very much. Any questions from the participants? <clears throat> Uh, maybe I'm not uh, understand, could understand. What is the particle in your uh, LIDAR measurement? Uh, particle is uh, the point uh, which, uh, um, which simulates our LIDAR position. Uh, we generate uh, a lot amount of uh, particles and then we filter them with uh, steps I mentioned above. And uh, thus uh, the points, uh, they are coming together closer to another points and uh, thus we can measure the position of our lidar. But uh, particle is position of lidar? No, <clears throat> particle is uh, like uh, another lidar which we uh which we will um i don't know how to tell about it uh, maybe the previous slides show this uh, um estimation ah this uh, complexity of algorithm this explanation of uh, parameters formula for for complexity uh yes and number of lidar movement iterations, number of measurement of every step, number of walls, number of generated particles. Q, number of generated particles. What is it, uh, Q? Uh, yeah, I'll tell about it on this figure. Uh, for example, this is our lidar. Yeah. And uh, we need, uh, we, don't need we don't know uh, about his position uh on the initial position his initial position on uh, so we need to generate uh, a lot of uh, particles uh, which are in our uh in our room so we then we will filter them uh for example after first step uh, on, on the start we have particles of, uh, on, a, on every point of our room. On the next step, we will have particles uh, which were grouped like probably here, here, and here. On the next step, we will filter them so if, uh, the particles will repopulate and uh, move closer to one group. And uh, for the next steps, we th this group will be... Uh, no, I understand, but uh, how physically we obtain this set of particles? Uh, uh, physically, we don't need them. We just... Uh, I, I don't know how to tell it. I suspect that LIDAR uh, make measurement around itself. Around yes. It, and each measurement give him a distance to some point to the next wall point of wall and this it's, yes. it's one po po uh, particle maybe it's particle measurement of lidar results uh, uh, measurement around itself so the lidar makes uh, the measurements about itself and uh, not about itself but about uh, um, um reflected some reflected place lidar tested uh, what is lidar is uh, 
sounding device. And the result of sounding is a measurement of distance. Maybe coordinate uh, of um, angle and distance. Angle 360 degrees around LIDAR and some around LIDAR uh, points that reflect sounding. It's maybe this is particle. Uh, no, no, no. The particles are uh, generated particles? in vertical, mm -hmm. in virtual uh, environment. There are not uh, real particles. Okay. Uh, we use them to because uh, determine. We, you use uh, virtual lidar, uh, virtual virtual particles. Understand? Yes, we use virtual particles, uh, and we use them to determine the position after each step of lidar. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, our lidar will make measurements. Then we. Uh, calculate weights of each measurement and uh, they will for example group like here and the lidar was like here so uh, then we can add up all uh, coordinates of these particles divide by the number of these particles and we will get an approximate location of our lidar mm -hmm. okay it's um all modeling what is uh, software you use for, for modeling? Uh, I was using uh, C++ and uh, CUDA algorithms. Ah, CUDA. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting task. Any so, other questions you. from people, participant? No other questions? Thank you, Dr. Matviyev. We Thank are you going, too. Yeah, um, going to next reporter. Juliana yeah. Lavrik, yes. Yeah, I am present. Good afternoon, all. Uh, so please, can you say whether you see my presentation? Yes, but um, this way. OK, yes, yes, yeah. please. Uh, so let's start. Uh, today I am excited to share with you a presentation uh, to my, our article on the topic product recommendation system using graph neural network by Juliana Lavrik and Yuri Krivenchuk. Uh, so first of all, a brief agenda. So throughout this presentation, we will explore the fundamental principles behind graph neural networks, also their applications in recommendation systems and the advantages of such applications. Uh, and uh, some particular results of our research as well. So now let's dive into the world of graph neural networks and uncover their remarkable potential. So let's start from the general, but to my mind, main question, uh, what is GNN? So GNN, short for graph neural network, is a cutting edge machine learning framework specifically designed to process and uh, analyze graph structure data. Uh, by leveraging the inherent relationships and connections within a graph, uh, GNNs enable us to capture complex patterns, extract valuable insights, and make uh, accurate predictions as a result. So uh, this revolutionary approach incorporates both node and edge features, allowing us to understand and model the intricate dependencies between uh, different entities like users or items. So now uh, to get better understanding, uh, let's look at the diagram which describes the graph network uh, in the terms of recommendation systems. Uh, so this slide shows main steps of using GNN for recommendation system. And uh, let's go through. Uh, the first step, get graph representation. Uh, so it means that the first step in utilizing uh, GNN for recommendation systems is to construct an appropriate graph representation uh, and in other words, uh, so this step involves uh, mapping the relevant entities such as users, items, and their relationships onto a graph structure. Uh, in such way, each entity becomes a node uh, and the relationships between them becomes edges, uh, forming, uh, forming uh, like rich interconnected network, uh, in other words, graph. 
So the second step, uh, learn node embeddings. Uh, once the graph representation is established, uh, GNNs learn node embeddings, which capture the related features and characteristics of each entity. And then uh, this step uh, directly moves to the next one, which is aggregation. Uh, so in the aggregation step, GNNs uh, gather and propagate information across the graph structure. Uh, this process involves aggregating the features and embeddings of uh, neighboring nodes, capturing the influence and relationships within the graph, and, uh, by, uh, and by iteratively updating and uh, refining the node embeddings, uh, GNNs generate a more comprehensive understanding of the graph and its entities. And uh, the last ones, I guess main ones, uh, make predictions and get recommendations. And so uh, with the node embeddings, GNNs can make predictions for recommendation tasks. Uh, by leveraging the learned representations, the GNNs can estimate a user's interest or preference for specific items. And so these predictions are typically based on user item interactions, historical data, or some metadata, uh, etc. And finally, get recommendations. Uh, so GNNs utilize the predictions to generate recommendations for a particular user. These recommendations can be ranked based on the estimated preferences or tailored to specific user preferences, providing personalized suggestions uh, that align uh, with the user's interests and needs. Uh, so by following the steps, uh, GNNs enhance the recommendation process using power of graph structures, also contextual information and user item relationships, uh, resulting in more effective and uh, uh, relative recommendations for users. Now let's move on to the advantages of using graph neural networks for recommendation systems. Uh, so among the numerous advantages of uh, such networks, uh, the following, I guess, can be highlighted. So the first one, uh, modeling complex relationships. Uh, so this one has already been partially mentioned. So it is like one of the key advantages of graph neural networks. Uh, so this is ability to effectively model uh, complex uh, higher order relationships between different entities by considering the connections and interactions uh, between them. Uh, also the second one, capturing uh, heterogeneous information. What I mean? So GNNs have the capability to handle heterogeneous information within the recommendation system. In addition to user item interactions, uh, GNNs also can incorporate uh, uh, different attributes and features associated with users and items. Uh, for example, when we talk about users, it can be user demographics uh, information, or if you talk about items, uh, some specific information regarding particular items. Uh, also the third one, flexibility and adaptability. So, uh, this is uh, neural networks, GNN neural networks can uh, handle different types of recommendation tasks, including personalized recommendations, item to item recommendations, and even group recommendations. So uh, such networks can be easily tailored and uh, tuned to specific domains and different directions. And uh, the last one uh, advantage, uh, addressing call start problem. So the call start problem uh, it is a problem when uh, there is limited or no user or item data available. So, and it is a really common challenge in recommendation systems. Uh, but GNNs have shown promise in addressing this problem by leveraging the graph structure and incorporating information from uh, mostly similar users and items. Uh, so, in summary, uh, GNNs bring really several significant advantages to recommendation systems. Uh, but now uh, let's move to the particular research uh, conducting regarding this article. And uh, first of all, I guess we can talk about uh, selected data for recommendation system based on GNN. Uh, so the research described in this article used Amazon product metadata and Amazon customer reviews data sets, uh, namely data related to the category books. Uh, so before building the model, this data set I can buy into, uh, into one based on the Amazon standard identification number. And now I want to talk briefly about these two types of data. So Amazon customer reviews, uh, 
Data includes product reviews and ratings by users. It can be used to construct a bipartite graph that connects users and products based on their review history. And also Amazon product metadata refers to the structured information associated with products available on the Amazon marketplace. If you talk about books, it can be like genre uh, of books, uh, price, uh, title, etc. Uh, so after downloading this data set, save a merge and then sampling was performed. Uh, namely, there were selected users uh, just with more than 10 transactions from merge data set to analyze users with a really sufficient user history and build model with better performance. So now uh, we can talk about the model architecture to, used in this research. So uh, there were research different types of GNN models architecture, for example, uh, graph convolution network, PinSage or GraphSage. Uh, so the last one was selected to use in this work. Uh, why? Because uh, this architecture can overcome large graph problem and is really useful for graphs that have large amount of not attribute information. And uh, we have uh, such situation when we use uh, Amazon data. So uh, this architecture is the GNN model based on bipartite graph. And uh, also besides of uh, training one of such model, uh, there were trained uh, different graph search models with different optimizers and learning rate values. But uh, about the results of such a hyperparameter tuning, we will talk uh, a bit later. Uh, so um, after that, uh, uh, we can move on to the next slide and uh, let's take a closer look at this architecture. Uh, so this slide describes the main parts of the GNN architecture named the graph sage. Uh, first of all, the model must receive input data in the graph representation. And then the model contains a GNN encoder. It consists of two convolutional layers in our case, which perform node replacement and aggregation in the graph. Uh, after that, uh, one more important and significant part, I guess, uh, process metadata in the heterogeneous graph. So GNN encoder instance is then transformed into a heterogeneous graph using the special function, which takes into account the metadata. Uh, so after that, the last one, uh, edge decoder. So this class represents the decoder module, which process the graph edges to predict internode relationships. Uh, overall, uh, so the model takes node features and edges uh, indices as input, uh, performs node-wise encoding, uh, and decodes relationships between nodes using the edge decoder. As a result, we get predictions, uh, which uh, are the predicted traits, uh, and uh, top curated books uh, will be considered as recommended books. So, uh, and after that, the last thing that is important to talk about is the evaluation of the built model and the tuning it. So there are several metrics uh, used to evaluate the performance of recommendation systems and uh, let's go through. Uh, the first one, uh, root mean square error, error. So also this metric, uh, um, it was used during training process as a loss form function. So this metric defines uh, in the terms of recommendation systems uh, whether the ratings predicted by the recommendation systems are close to the actual ones, uh, I mean given by users. Uh, precision in the context of a recommendation system is calculated by uh, considering the recommended items for each user and uh, determining how many of them are actually relevant to the user's preferences. And the last one, recall, uh, this metric in the terms of recommendation systems uh, calculates how um, many of the relevant items have been including in the recommendations for each user. So this metric can help identify strengths and limitations of GNN-based recommendation systems and uh, guide further improvements in the model architecture. Uh, so. Uh, on this slide, you can see results uh, of calculation of this matrix. Uh, and based on results in this table, uh, there is a conclusion that the best performance has a model with the optimizer Adam and learning rate 0 0.01, when precision and recall are highest and RMCA, RMCA value, both for training, validation, and test samples are slightly above one, 
so which means that uh, the built predictive models appears to be performing significantly well at predicting uh, users' rating and giving relevant recommendations. Uh, so now we can move on to the conclusions. So uh, during this walk, uh, the use of graph neural networks in product recommendation system was explored. Also uh, was built GNN model of graph uh, architecture for recommendation system. And uh, in summary, GNN based recommendation systems uh, offer really several advantages over traditional recommendation systems. However, uh, there are still several areas for future research and improvements. Uh, for example, the development of more sophisticated GNN architectures that can capture uh, yet higher order relationships among products and users. And also one moment that uh, the interpretability of GNN based recommendation systems needs to be improved uh, to enable users to understand uh, how recommendations uh, are generated. But in general, uh, this approach has shown promise in improving the accuracy and relevance of product recommendations. Uh, but of course, this research uh, is like starting point for future research in this exciting and rapidly evolving field. So uh, that's all for me. Thank you for your attention very much. And I will be glad to answer you, your questions if you, you have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody have questions to reporter uh, for the start time? I want to um, how to understand this graph network. It handmade for recommendation system or some way generated automatically. Yeah, you mean this architecture, yeah. No architecture, but the uh, structure of uh, this uh, knowledge bed database graph GNN. How is generated GNN? And ah, yeah. uh, in Python, uh, there is PyTorch geometric library, and uh, we generated this model using tools from uh, such library. Uh, there uh, are different tools to um, encode our input data into embeddings and also to build uh, models with such architecture. There are even uh, SageConf uh, layers here yeah, built in this library, in the library of uh, PyTorch Geometric, and we used uh, uh, the stuff uh, during our work. Yeah, but uh, you should teach system um, for Part particle, uh, mm. Mm -hmm. some special mm, um, domain. Your recommendation system work in some domain, yeah? Um, uh, yeah, based on now, it is based on books category from Amazon My Marketplace. Yeah, yeah, we selected the data All sets. Regarding categories are in your uh, graphical uh, GNN. GNN contains all uh, items from this Amazon. Uh, yeah, regarding books, uh, but it is like very large data set about nine millions of records. So for training, uh, we just used uh, about two millions of different records regarding user and items, uh, in other case, books. Uh, relations. So uh, we used just 2 million for training and uh, about uh, 400,000 for test purposes. Okay, now I understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. I, I have, um, the question is about um, the, you maybe familiar with this new trend called explainable AI. Um, so when you give nowadays recommendation, often you say why you give this recommendation based on which data and based on which uh, features. Okay. Have you thought about, uh, or is it possible to apply this explainable AI to graph neural networks? 
Yes, so output, if you understand you correctly, so output mm -hmm. of our model is uh, predicted rights. Yeah, for example, right, uh, in our case, we have rights from zero to five for books. Yeah, and our model uh, predict, uh, uh, predicts this rights. And uh, after that, uh, we just have to select, uh, for example, uh, it uh, depends from our wish, for example, top five uh, predicted uh, uh, writings here yeah, uh, regarding uh, uh, their value. For example, uh, top five uh, will have like five, five, four, four, and three. Yeah, and uh, this uh, books uh, will be considered as uh, recommendations for this model. But it is like just uh, such type of model. Also, there are different architectures uh, of GNN neural network models, which also generate uh, immediately uh, recommendations, not ratings. Yeah, but in our case, uh, output of our model will be different ratings for books. And uh, we just have to select uh, top car ratings uh, to get recommendations. But not explain why. Uh, I was uh, my question. Yes, uh, was a bit different. Um, I I see. I understand that you use ratings, which is one particular way to give recommendations and rankings. And um, my question was about explainable AI. I typed in the chat. There's a chat. Uh, there's a trend in the AI communities that you not only give recommendations but you also explain the recommendations. So it might be something interesting to look into. Um. Uh, yeah, you mean about uh, interpretability, yeah? Of yes, the yes, exactly, that. exactly. Because the large neural yeah. networks, they uh, normally have a lack of interpretability, but you can add this um, functionality and I'm, I, I have not seen it in graph neural networks, but I'm curious if it is already done there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because of that, I uh, mentioned about this point uh, here, yeah, about like mm -hmm. future uh, research steps, uh, interpretability, because okay. uh, mm -hmm. to be honest, it is like uh, one of the drawbacks of recommendation systems. Uh, it is uh, uh, really difficult in some cases to interpret results because we have large graph and huge amount of data and uh, sometimes it can be challenging yeah so mm. it's like our next step for this research because it is really like disadvantage i guess of this approach maybe it's just uh, it's not only i mean it's not a disadvantage but it's something nice to also have <laughs> some yeah, interpretability. Yeah. so it's good if you can make good predictions uh, people are, yeah. Yeah. So I think it's some nice extension system. Yeah. And you can uh, normally also um, achieve interpretability by adding um, it to neural networks. That is this explainable AI. They, they use the neural network and generate explanations uh, mm -hmm. based on the output and input. Yeah, it will okay, be useful, especially for users. Right. Mm -hmm. So they are model agnostic in that sense. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Thank you. And now we have uh, the last uh, report for today. Alexander Yeremchenko. Yeremchenko. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good day. Hi. I will try to show also me. I think it will be more. <laughs> A pleasure to see my face, maybe. Uh, uh, just a second, uh, share my screen. Uh, I think now you need to see my screen. Yes, we can see. Uh, so, uh, uh, good day again. Uh, my name is Alexander Ramchenko, and I want to present my article investigation and comparative analysis of algorithm about the recognition of micromimics for analysis of person using emotional AI. Uh, I'm from the uh, National University Polytechnic, and I made it in a collaboration with Petro Pukaj. So uh, the problematics is that today we have um, a lot of people that, so I will tell another way. I had an idea that uh, when speak, uh, when people is speaking which is other which is uh, each other uh, they do not understand 
what uh, the other person really is thinking. What I mean, they, they're telling that they're happy, but in fact, it is not like that. Uh, every person do not normally uh, understand how other person is thinking and what really feeling. It's a, it's a big mistake of the people. But also in some robotics, we have the robots that looks like <laughs> robot. They not, uh, don't. A lot of people are afraid of these robots because they have very um, cutted emotions, and we cannot recognize them normally. Uh, and one of the things that it is affecting this is missing the micro emotions. This thing is our brain. Uh, it is not noticeable because we live with this. We feel that person feel something strange, but we do not notice really uh, what is inside that person and why we thought that something wrong with this person. And the idea was to uh, make a system that will be able to recognize the emotions and build more clear picture of uh, emotional state of the person. So problematics of this is that uh, facial expressions are universal system of significant, oh, just a second, sorry. Uh, the facial expression are universal system of signals, which reflect uh, the moment-to-moment -moment, uh, fluctuations of the personal emotional state. At 1 25th of the second, micro expression can be difficult to recognize and detect. Uh, yet, the, with micro expression training tools, we can learn and spot them as they occur in real time. These tools are presented by Paul Ekman. He is a uh, founder of the, of the technology of idea of scanning of micromimics. And when someone tries to conceal their emotions, uh, leakage of the emotion will often evident in their face. Uh, the leakage may show in micro expressions. So uh, we have different data sets and it's like some uh, examples of the, these micro emotions. They're just for 125 seconds. It's hard to entice them. But often we are also making the mistake which real emotion we can see on the person's face. So these are pictures are for the subject from database of SMIC. I would SMIC. Uh, 